you hear the great cross that calls across times. Yeah. Ladies what up, and what up, gentlemen, what up, what up? Cross examine. Back to the grill again. The grill yes. again. Back to the grill again. The grill again. You know what? Here's the thing. I, I think I'm glad YouTube did this for, for artists, right? But I hate the fact that we just can't pull up that old hip hop where we get these slogans know, from and play them know, because we'll get a copyright infringement strike. So back to the grill again is from a song, Third Base, man. One of the first, well, they, they were the first white rappers, right? Well, I mean, yeah, that no, no, I was, Beastie Boys, that I, Beastie Boys, that I'm sorry. banged with. I mean, Beastie yeah, Boys was dope, us? but you know, like. Beastie Boys was kind of rock though. Let's keep it. They was like, a little rock yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah. You, you had rock. to be. You had to be more mature in hip hop to appreciate right. the Beastie Boys. You yeah, know what they saying? was more rock. They had yeah. some rap. They had crazy stuff like girls, ball, 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 ball. That's all. Yeah, right. that joint was hard yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when that joint came on, you was yeah. rocking to it. Stop yeah, fronting. Right. Yeah, that's you like that Shana Na, dude. That's why you was back in that Shana Na. Shana Na, Na, Shana Na, Na, Na. Ladies and gentlemen, Cross Examine, Season 5, Episode We're here now. 6. You know what I'm yes. saying? Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. If you're going to join the live stream, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you if you're listening to us on the podcast, I have a podcast. Appreciate you. The love is there. The love is there. Yes, Wakanda forever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. Now, normally at, at this point of the show, we usually see in the back corner of Strax page, you will usually see a dope paint, like a picture. You'd be like, hold on, what is that? <laughs> and you realize that that's track with the abnersbrush.com. You yes. need to go ahead and get yourself right, right? Word. But tonight is my turn. I mean, wait, hold, hold on, hold on. We got the, we got the joint okay. right there. Tonight though, is my so turn, got, though. Uh, oh, okay, right, I we'll, see. All right, we'll put it I back. See. We'll put it back. We'll put it back. All right. Tonight, so, tonight is, my is turn. your turn. All right. My turn. So let me show y'all my joint. I, I don't paint like my, my, my man does. I use I catch them with the clicker with the camera. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let me let me let me show you. This is my first my first ever print this big. Oh, you got one printed. Thirty two by twenty four came yesterday. Look at this. Oh, I know y'all yes. can't see all of it because of the lights, right? Yo, that is so is, fly. This is my joint right here. Yeah, we're seeing the screen right now, the computer screen. But that joint, listen, that yeah. image, you got to post that image, fam. Yeah, I, I will post it, but I'm trying to finish the ishotcha.org site because there are people that have already asked me for prints of it. Got so you. what this what this picture is, it is a lighthouse in San Francisco. It's way like, like so what you see is a lighthouse and then you'll see the Golden Gate Bridge in the backdrop and so I found out about this website called Framing Bridge from another photographer that I follow he had ordered a print from there and I was like oh let me check that out so when he did that I thought okay let me let me see what he's working with you know so I saw let me see if I'm gonna see if I can do this and bring this in for you guys hold on one second let me try something Let me just see if you can see this. Bring this in. But this guy uh, had that print. So I just thought, let me go to their site and just see. Because yeah. I like this guy. He's a good photographer. And so I went there. And it was a little little bit pricey. But I thought, you know what? Let's just go through the Let's just see. I don't have to buy anything. And so when you upload your photo, it'll tell you what's the largest size print they can do with that with that photo. Based on like the DPI. Break, like yeah, the break, yeah, all that. Based on all the eggs of data, right? All right, that right. stuff. So when it said 36 by 24, mm. I was like, I was going to say 20 by 30. That's what I was going to ask if it was a 20 by 30. Yeah, nah, this joint 20. So when they said that, I was like, hold on, fam. This is, um, so I'm trying to see where it, where did I put that photo? Hold on one second. I'm going to, I want to pull that photo up so that y'all can really see what's popping. So y'all know, so we can be on, uh, what's this, what's that, what's that dude's name? Uh, Jack Harlow. You know, oh yeah, yeah. The, the rapper was popping. Yeah, right. He ain't right, come so over. Was popping. He be saying was popping. Yeah, he had a song called "Was Popping." You know what I'm saying? You what's, obviously what's not up to date. You know? Nah, saying? I've been saying right. was popping since I was a kid, man. Right. Like, get out of here with all that. All right, I'm gonna bring in. So I'm gonna show you. So this is the print that I just got. Here we go. Just give me a second. Stay with. I know if, if you're listening or not. I know you can't see this. 
But that's why you need to come on over to YouTube, the Kirk Kennedy's Corner. Yeah. You need to come on over to YouTube, all right? So right now, so this is, is this it? No, that's not it. What are you talking about? 30, close 374. Okay, right. Hold on. 0374. Stop playing, man. Got some joints in here. I don't need this. Delete overlay. Delete overlay. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, so here it is, ladies and gentlemen. So I just got my first print, 36 by 24. I'm about to get fabulous. another one, all right? Here's what the print looks like. This is it right here. Woo! That's, that's yes. my, that's, I shot you. That's my joint. That that's was gorgeous. A, that joint is tough, man. I'm so, I'm so excited about it. And so that'll be, people have been asking, can they buy that print already? So I'm excited. Also, uh, it is. We'll we'll get into that more. So that's so that's the print. Let me give you one more look at that. One more shine there. Yes. I just got a big thirty six by twenty four print of this. I'm grateful for that. Love that man. It's, it's, I'm I'm really trying to step my game up in photography. So it's been really cool about that. So I'm excited. I love it. I love so your work, been, man. I'm a fan. Yeah, man. You too, bro. I love your stuff, man. So I appreciate that. So all right. Let's talk uh, today. Actually, I just officially dropped the this. So I'm just we just on we on point right now. So I officially dropped this today, ladies and gentlemen. I officially dropped "Serial Killers Still Smiling" the mixtape. All right. So yes. let me talk a little bit about this. So last year, I dropped an album about this time last year called "Serial Killers Smiling Pictures." Correct. And that album was an albumentary where I did a, I just did a, basically a deep study on why are we fascinated with serial killers? Why are we fascinated with violence? All right. So as I was doing that, the actual idea came from just one day me and Strack were joking around on the podcast. And I was coming up, I said that Christian art needs to be more creative. I said, there's so many things to talk about. And we're always either sharing our testimonies or talking about who we and I just started naming topics that we could talk about. And I just said, serial <laughs> yeah, killers I remember, that. remember that? <laughs> yeah, and I, I just said that. that. And we was like, yo, that's a dope concept. And I was right, like, yeah, right. bro. That's the that's a dope joint, right? And so, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, baby. Yeah, and the Lord told me, Vision, to go ahead and pay a couple of dollars for that print. You know mm. what I'm saying? So, I, I, we, I like the title. And so, I was just going to do an album that was really just like beats and bars. It wasn't going to be like albumentary. It wasn't. But the more I started to study the idea of serial killers and the and, and particularly the American fascination with serial killers and just violence. And then so I just as I got into it, it just became like, whoa, there's a deeper issue here. So right. I dropped an album last year. I dropped Serial Killers Smiling Pictures. And that was this album. I dropped this last year. That's streaming everywhere. And so I wanted to still do kind of the Bars and Beats album. So I, I just said, you know what? What Serial Killers Smiling Pictures was supposed to be is what Serial Killers Still Smiling is, right? So this is not the typical Kirk Kennedy project. I, I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate all the people that have already bought the album. I'm only making it available on Bandcamp, which you can access on my, um, at KirkKennedy.com. And so far, I'm actually really encouraged the people that have been buying it and stuff. But, but that's it's really just an album that's bars and beats. I just I, most of my albums are really deep and you did multiple listens. I just wanted to give people something they could just have fun with and ride out to. So it's it's just a mixtape. And uh, but I am releasing a real album called "I'm Warning You: Do Not Listen to This Album" in January, and that will be a real album. And it's really personal, and it's going to really hit some stuff. Some stuff you've probably heard me touch on. But it's going to hit some real personal things. Been through a lot the last couple of years. And I haven't done an album where I'm that personal since chapter three, since I was talking about that stuff. So, but please go pick that up. It's Serial Killers Still, Still smiling. smiling. Yeah. And that will be in, it's on KirkKennedy.com. So we'll, we'll continue to talk about that through that. And so I'm grateful for that. Excited. All right, Strack, let's tell us about your singles, man. You got, you got some joints out there, man. You're doing the low key. You pivot, you pivot yeah, so I actually OG. have a single dropping every other Friday mm. um, for a little while. So I'm gonna, I think we're totally going to be dropping nine. Um, but uh, yeah, this this Friday, we won't have one dropping. One just dropped last this past Friday called Can You Hear? The project is with me and the Apologists of Christ Centric. 
the vet in the game, you know, 20 years right. uh, and, and keeping on pushing. Um, he is Mexican. the he's the producer. So he produced the, the whole joint. Every track is produced by him. And then, of course, I'm coming up with the song concepts and stuff. Um, so, yeah, every every other Friday you got John's banging. But this Friday coming out, not not tomorrow, um, but actually or today. But next Friday, a song will be dropping where I feature my grandchildren on that joint. They'll be singing the singing on the hook. Um, about wanting to see the Lord. So it's a dope, dope project, dope song. I hope y'all love it. Yeah, be on the lookout every other Friday. Available every everywhere. Other, every other Friday. That's what's frit, up. Frit, 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 frit. All right, we're going to start the new segment, ladies and gentlemen. So we got the mixtape. We covered that. We're going to start the new segment today called You Can't Make This Stuff Up. Nah. <laughs> all right. You can't make this stuff up. This is real stuff, all right? So let me read you this particular, first of all, well, let me say this first. So we're going to talk about this documentary called God Forbid, all right? But what I thought was incredible in the documentary, Jerry Falwell Jr. is talking about Donald Trump. And he says, Donald Trump single-handedly got Obama to release his birth certificate. And then all the crowd like burst in the, in the clapping and all that. And immediately when I heard him say that, I thought to myself, but Donald Trump wouldn't release his taxes. <laughs> his taxes. <laughs> so they're celebrating that he got him to, to, release, to, to release his birth certificate, but Donald Trump wouldn't release his taxes. I just thought that's just so ironic, right? <laughs> that's so funny. They'd be like, oh, look what he did. And look what he did do, right? Right. But here's, here's, this is a real story. You can't make this stuff up. I'm about to read to you a real story. Oh, there's right? more. I thought that was it. No, that's just one okay. of them. This is the, right, that was right, just a right. sidebar. Because I thought that was hilarious. It here's is. the real story. You can't make this stuff up. Here's a real story. Listen to what it says. Two men accused of cheating in an Ohio fishing tournament have pleaded not guilty to the charges filed against them. All right. Jacob Runyon and Chase Kaminsky are each charged with cheating, attempted grand theft, possessing criminal tools, all felonies, and unlawful ownership of wild animals, a misdemeanor. All right. The CNN has reached out to their attorneys for comment. And here's what it says. The charges stem from accusations that the men cheated during the Lake Erie Walleye Trail fishing tournament in late September, after it was discovered, their fish were stuffed with lead weights and fish fillets. If they had been declared winners of the event, they would have received nearly $29,000. What? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's like... Deflate gate type joint. Oh man! They got hold on. They got they had lead oh, in their fish. Slip. Like, like they was weighted down. They was stuffing catfish with dead mice. Listen, these dudes are crazy. They they were. This is real. This is you can't make this up. These dudes tried to scam, cheat in an Ohio fishing tournament. When the scripture, when when Second Timothy three talks about inventors of evil, right, this is that. Yo, so that so these dudes they're getting charged with possession of criminal tools, unlawful ownership of wild animals, and and what they did was they they stuffed they had their fish stuffed with lead weights, and and fish fillets. Yo. I mean, think about the effort that took. They, I mean, they worked like they was ready to get paid twenty thousand dollars. Like that's how they worked. Twenty nine grand, bro. They would have won twenty nine grand. That's crazy, bro. You gotta be kidding me, fam. Inventors of evil, man. You right. Inventors right. of evil, fam. That's wow. I just, I can't believe it. You can't make this stuff up. Nah, you definitely can't make that up. All right, let's talk about last week's episode. Some of you may have known, and some people, I think, did know because they got to me. Last week's episode, we took down. I took it down. I told Strike I was going to take it down. I want to explain why I took last week's episode down. Um, the episode was called I'm Not Growing, and essentially, 
it was I I used a, a we pivoted off an email of someone who left my church and said that they weren't being fed and weren't growing. And uh, after the show, someone a former member of the church emailed me and said that they felt like that I was wrong to do that. I was not the same uh, person. Not the same person. That person I haven't heard from that person, but that this person I think is friends with that person or knows that person. So they emailed me and said that they felt like that was wrong of me to do and said I need to repent and so forth and so forth and take the episode down, right? So I I always try to learn from these situations. And so I sent the email to Strack and said, what do you think about this? And I sent it to some other people who were pretty conscientious about stuff like that. Asked them to listen to the episode to see if they felt like I sinned against the person who left the church. And, um, and then in the pro, so I got back to the person that said, I will look into this and all of that. That was all I said in the email. Thank you. I'll look into this. I'll definitely look into it. So afterwards I got, I was told by another member of my church that a, a different person who was a former member was sending an email to people in my church saying that me and the leadership team were trying to slander the person who's um, the excerpt of the email that I read. Now, mind you, I didn't say, you wouldn't even know if it was a male or female. I gave no indication of anything about that. The, the show wasn't really about the email. It was using the email as a catalyst for a bigger discussion yeah. about how Christians process their growing and not growing and so forth and leaving churches. And we have talked about these things before. So after hearing that, that this other person was sending emails to members of my church and other people, I took the episode down, but I didn't take it down because I felt like I really, really sinned against this other person. I took it down because I didn't want my leadership team to be slandered because it's not true. My leadership team has nothing to do with cross-examine. And I think, I think, I think, and I don't know this, I think that they may have perhaps listened to the show and saw it through the lens of thinking everything we're saying is what the person who left my church was saying. And I actually started that segment off and said, and I'm going to humble myself right now because no one wants to say, no pastor wants to say people are leaving my church and so forth. Right. So, um, so, I, so I, I, I took it down for that reason and said, okay, I'm just going to take it down because I felt like it's going to, that's not true. My leadership team is not trying, that's not it at all. That wasn't the case. And I thought, I don't want them to be drug in to the, to some type of, and it's really, it's not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of it, but I wanted you all to know this because some people were like, Hey, what happened to the episode? I couldn't find it. And I said, I'm going to explain what happened. Now, if you're the people who have been watching and stuff and all that, I would prefer, you don't need to send me any more emails. I don't need any more communication with you about these things. I appreciate that you send that and we, but I took it down because I felt like there were things being said that were not true by someone else and they were emailing them to people in our church. And it's just not that serious. Like me and Strack loved this show. We do stuff and we, you know, we're pretty cautious. I usually actually, as a matter of fact, Strack, we even talked about it. I don't think I've ever even brought in someone's an email. And, and again, we left that anonymous. You would only that person knew because I think that person knew that the person had sent that email. Yeah. The only way somebody would have known, like, I mean, I, you know, we're, we're tight. I have no idea who this person is. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. I, I Nobody, they wouldn't have known unless they actually were privy to the information that mm -hmm. was in the letter. Mm -hmm. That's the only way anyone would have known who the person was. Yeah, and I've just, I've, I've just learned a lot in the last two couple of years, man, about being a pastor and about, you know, dealing, having to do all this stuff and just how people react to things and and all of that. And I, th I think there was, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just leave it at that. So we took that episode down, but essentially, here was if I were to put. Here was the point that we were trying to make. So I want to just reiterate this because it bleeds over into what we're going to talk about it does. today. It does. Very convenient. It bleeds over significantly. So if in essence, the, I'm not growing, in essence, this is what we were trying to communicate. And again, I wasn't trying to say, oh, this person who left is thinking this way. Although I think there, were, I did, there was one comment I told you, Strack. Okay, I, I could see how someone would be tempted by that comment. But it was still a true comment, what I said. But again, it was amb ambiguous in terms of not knowing who that person was. So again, if you're right. 
If you think I'm wrong in that, I don't need any more emails from you to tell me you think I'm wrong or disagree. I'm not going to entertain that. You, you're not no longer a member of my church, and that's fine. But what what um, last week's episode was essentially, in a nutshell, we were basically saying that growth is a choice. If I were to sum it all up, like growth as a Christian is a choice, and there are times where I think we blame other people, other circumstances, whether it's your pastor or the church structure or this, like, you know, like growth is a choice. And I've said this before in the past, but I would say it like this. As a believer, growth is not inevitable. It's not like in, in, the, in the natural world, we'll grow. We just grow. It's inevitable unless there's some kind of, but even if there's some kind Defense. of deficiency, yes, you're going to grow. Everyone yeah. grows. So in like, some you know, capacity was, or another. Yeah. yeah, some capacity you grow. Even if it's not in height, you grow in maturity, right, understanding, right. whatever it is, right? Everyone grows in the natural world. Right. Like if you and if it's if it's a typical growth, then you'll be able to highlight, like you know, you mark yourself on the wall, see how much you're growing. We used to do that when I was a kid to see how much you've grown. Everyone in the natural world will grow, but in the spiritual world, it's not that way. Growth is a choice. Because you can profess to believe in God and then not really make any progress, not submit yourself to the means of grace that God's provided, like a church, his word, prayer, fasting, uh, resisting temptation. You can do or you can profess, but not grow. Growth is not inevitable. It's intentional, right? And so some of the verses that we used was stuff like this. We used Jude 121. Keep yourselves in the love of God waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life, right? So the, the emphasis there is keep yourself in the love of God. Like you have a responsibility to do that. And so that was essentially what we were saying. It wasn't even about the person who left. I was using that to make a broader point that I've talked to a lot of pastors about and, and understood that, right? Right. And then there's another verse we looked at, 2 Peter 1.10. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble, right? So you get this, like you do, if you do these things, if you make every effort, if you confirm your call, you will never stumble, right? So the emphasis is on, as a believer, personal growth, I gotta work at this, right? It's not, now don't get me wrong, there are bad churches, bad structures, and I made, there are times that we've, we've made adjustments and changes. I'm not saying that, and I even said this on the episode last week, the person may have very valid reasons why they felt like they weren't growing. It wasn't like I was saying, oh, they're all, I made that clear. But I think largely a lot of growth is, you, is we blame on other circumstances, right? Yeah. And I actually think that it's a scheme of the devil to make us think that growth is something that solely happens to us. It's not something that comes from us. Like we we participate, right? We're a part of the growing process. You know, well, I mean, I know if you think about it, just just to add a little something, anytime you talk about responsibility, people want to shy away from it. You know, they want to mm -hmm. shy away from responsibility. So if there's an if there's an exit plan, or if there's a an ulterior motive or an ulterior, uh, you know, blame that can be casted, it yeah. will be casted. Yeah, it will be. I mean, and that's just, I think, and we just, we've inherited that from Adam and Eve, right? We went right. back we to that. We looked at that. that. Yeah. We looked at that from Adam and Eve. We inherited yeah. that, like the independence, fear, and blame. We talked about that, right? So that's just the reality. Whether I read from an email or not, we everything we said, we would agree with and, and, and maintain that reality. And sometimes when people leave churches, they, you know, the challenging thing about being a pastor, here's what's challenging, is we have always more knowledge than we're willing to say. There's always, so when people leave and they blame it on the pastor or they, or sometimes church hurt, sometimes church hurt is you hurt people and then you got corrected and then you didn't like it, whatever it is. It's not always you were a victim, right? It's always, church hurt is passive. Something happened to me, but it could be people are reacting to things that you said and did. That's also a part of it. But as a pastor, you know a lot of the different sides and angles and you just don't say anything. You don't say my, there's so much I could have said last episode, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say those things in that in that context. And even, you know, emails that were going around, it's like, there's so much I could say. And it's like, but you know, that's not what we do. But like, 
you learn, you realize like, yeah, man, sometimes you just gotta take it to the chin. What I won't do though, is let anyone slander like my leadership team and stuff like that. These are people that I don't, they don't even, like my, my church doesn't even watch my podcast. Most of the people who subscribe to our channel, they're not even members of my church. There's a few people that do, but I don't even care cause I don't even promote my podcast or anything at my church. I feel like Kirk Kennedy is different. When my pastor there is different, those things are different. So. But I do think that there is a, I think there is a scheme of the devil to make us think that growth is something that happens to us. We're passive. Mm -hmm. We're just waiting to grow. And so you show up at a place and you don't avail yourself to the means of grace that it provided. You make some bad decisions and then you blame the consequences of those decisions on whoever it is, whatever the circumstances. That happens a lot. And I'm not even talking about my church. I'm talking about just talking to pastors across the country. This is a common theme and one that was significantly revealed because of COVID. Uh, Revelation 2, 7, we didn't talk about this last week, but it says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So hear the language, to the one who conquers, right? And uh, the other languages to the one who perseveres to the end, right? right? Essentially, what God is saying is you as a believer, me, everyone, we are responsible. Now he works in us too. Don't get me wrong. It's not like he's not doing any work. We got Philippians 1, 6, but he who began a good work and you will carry to completion. I, until I was that at day. Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, yeah. my beloved, as you have always obeyed. So now not only in my presence, but also in my absence, work mm -hmm. out your own salvation with mm -hmm. fear and trembling. Yeah, he, he, that, that's it. So there's this, there's this. Or it is God who works in you both to will and to will. Right. Yeah. So it's like God gives us a desire, but God doesn't force us, right? We're not like right. zombies, right? We're not like, you know, we, we, we make decisions to take our thoughts captive, right? We, you know, God is impressed with faith. He like. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? And what does faith consist of? He exists and rewards those who seek him, right? right? So the reality is, is there's a sense where we are responsible to be careful to make sure that we're keeping ourselves in the love of God, that we're working on our salvation, that we're participating, that we're taking seriously our responsibility. And this is why Strack and I talk about theological gospel and all of this. And there are times when people in your church and sometimes people, I, there are people who have left my church who I feel like have not taken that responsibility seriously and may say, it's you guys. And then there are times there's legitimate reasons why we need to improve and we need to grow. It goes both ways. But it's I mean, not always Christian. us. The structure is this. It's not always the pastors. It's not always that. There's there's sometimes, you, you know, you can be challenging and not take seriously. You want to grow, but you want it to happen without you putting in much effort. If there's not a desire for your growth in you personally, like if you if you if there's not a desire for you to actually apply the the tactics needed for growth, like if you don't desire to read God's word, mm -hmm. if you don't desire to have fellowship with the saints, if you don't desire to pray, like if you don't desire those things, you seriously have to question if you're of the faith. You really you do. do. I think you do. And again, this is not we're not talking about my church right now. So if you're listening and trying to judge us, that we're just talking in general. In general, as a Christian, yeah, Christian I'm not. A, I'm not a part. I'm not a, a member at Solid Rock Church. Like, right. You know, this yeah. is. Well, I'm just making. I, I just. I just know how people are. Yeah, man. yeah, and they, for they sure. Read into yeah. things and they process it. And that's it why becomes, I'm saying it. Yeah, that's I'm why I'm saying. I'm not reading any more emails from these people. Yep. So, yep. Um, but I think the the thing that what we're getting at is I think there is a sense where we do process spiritual growth like natural growth. And we're just waiting for things to happen. And I think we get stuck because it's easier to just think this is going to happen. And there are, there are times when, man, it seems like we're really, really growing. We're really, really making progress. And it almost seems like, man, I'm just loving this stuff. I want to stay in this place where there's a desire to read. There's a desire to do those things. And that doesn't always happen. There are times when, we no, God's going to let you work out your salvation. He's going to let you press in. You yeah. got to go after these things. You got to do these things and all of it, right? Right. But plus, you know, a lot of your growth comes from you uh, supplying what is needed for the growth of another. 100%. You know, that's one of the things that we Break that down last... a little bit so that people can get that because you're a poetic dude. Yeah, because, you know, so when, so when you talk about um, putting your hands to the plow and the Lord talks about not looking back, when you've put your hands to the plow, a lot of your plowing is going to be for others to eat. 
not you necessarily. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. and what I mean by that is like, you know, things you've gone through in your life, the Lord will, he, he almost accumulates a diary of testimonies in mm-hmm. order for you to, to be able to pull out later and say, well, you're going through this or oh, I've been through something very similar. Let me, let me explain how the Lord has delivered me through that situation or whatever the case may be. Oftentimes we miss the fact that we've been gifted to help grow the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because we're so consumed with our own growth or lack thereof, mm-hmm. um, that we begin to look around and we're like, well, if I'm not growing, I can't help anybody else grow. So I'm right, out of right, here. Right, right, right. When Isn't in that reality, a crazy hustle that the enemy yeah, the well, scheme of the devil, it, right? In reality, your time of not growing is probably when you're supposed to be pressing in to help mm-hmm. someone else grow so that you can grow in the process. And let me say this too, to, pip, to, to piggyback off of that for, uh, for believers. Sometimes we think like, oh man, I can't help this person because I struggle with the same thing, right? You know, here's the reality. Sometimes you, someone, will, the Lord will let someone come to you and you struggle with the same thing and you think, mm-hmm. well, I'm a hypocrite if I help him. You know what I think the Lord is doing in those moments? He's getting you to speak truth to that person so that you also hear yourself. and apply it for yourself. Amen. Truth is truth whether you apply it or not. So we can always... <laughs> share yeah. things that are true even if we're not living them like you know have we you see noticed that with your music have you noticed that with your music like at times like i know for myself i'll write things in my music that later on come back and rock me 100 like, oh, like, like, yo 100 <laughs> percent like yeah. that yeah yeah or yeah. oh, you write things years ago which you struggle with and you're like right Dag, i'm still struggling with it i'm not right. taking this area serious you know what i'm saying yeah. like that's the stuff yeah. that's just and that's humbling but it's like you need that you need to see like okay wow because there's forgiveness for that but then it's like all right let's i gotta switch some things up but i think sometimes as believers we think like you know we kind of have a which is workspace like okay i need to make sure i'm cleaned up and all this before i can help somebody else right no i don't think you should be walking with your chest out like yeah come talk to me because i haven't done this in two days it's like well fam (laughs) Have a little bit more of a pattern of consistency, right? That, but I think there are going to be times where the Lord is going to let you, just the humblest. There are times people yeah. have come to me and said, hey, man, I'm struggling with my wife or this. I'm like, dang, man, I'm struggling with some of the same stuff. The plank or in I'm your doing own this eye. thing and my wife is offended at me for doing it. You know, she's writing and, and I still got to speak truth. And it's, it's humbling. The plank in your own eye concept is for, for not judging people. Right. Like, you know, it's, it's so that you don't judge others and be a hypocrite while you yourself are dealing with the own, you know what I'm saying? That's don't judge others. It doesn't say don't minister to others. It doesn't say don't care and love others in the midst of your funk. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you will come out of funk by helping and serving others mm-hmm. as the Lord will use that to help build you mm-hmm. out of your funk. Real rap, yeah. man. It happens all yeah, the time. It it happens all the time. I mean, even in prayer, if you, this is a dope concept. If you think about this. So when you go before the Lord in prayer and you don't know what to pray about for yourself, begin praying for others. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Just just mm-hmm. start praying for others and you'll yeah. see the Lord begin to reveal your own issues and you'll go before the Lord with your own things yeah. because oftentimes as you pray for others, it'll trigger your own thoughts of what you need. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Or, well or, vice, or vice versa. Well said. Well said. All right, so having said all of that, having said all of that, all right, what we want to talk about today is we want to part two last week's discussion, but from a different angle. Okay, so last week was I'm not growing. This one is a different angle with a slightly different concern, but it's sort of a cousin of I'm not growing and, and it's 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 someone else's fault. We want to come from a different angle that I think I know that I have at times, even as a pastor, this has crippled me as a believer, the perspective I'm about to share. And I've seen it cripple a lot of people, and particularly with coming out of COVID, I've seen this happen to just different people and have talked to pastors and it's like, wow, this is a thing. So we're going to talk about a a, sort of a a different angle on the I'm not growing and and give sort of a a reason or or, or offer a, 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 you know, a perspective that it's kind of a concern to just for you to process and see if this is something that you may struggle with. All right. And and the way we got to this point was by a unlikely, unlikely point, by a documentary recently released called God Forbid. All right. This is a documentary on Hulu called God Forbid. All right. Now, let me just say this. This is not a Christian documentary, but right. it is about a Christian family. 
but it's not Christian. And by that, and the reason why I'm saying that is because it, it they have like the silhouette reenactments of fornication, sexual intercourse and things like that, right? They have these, so you got to look past them and go past them. And they're not a lot. It's not a lot, but there's, there's stuff in there that you might be like, all right, I don't want to. I don't want to look at that, but it's not really what well, you can't see a lot, but if you got an imagination, then you can put it together. So it's best to just not, it's not hard. It's not hard to imagine what's going on. Right. So even though it don't show, but it's not a Christian documentary, but this documentary is about a very significant Christian family. All right. Now I found out about this. I was on Twitter and there's some, some brothers that I follow. And one guy said he was watching the documentary and I kind of respect this guy. He's a good thinker. He's written a couple of books and he just has some perspectives that I appreciate. So when he said he was watching this documentary, I thought, let me go to Hulu and watch this. I had no idea what it was going to be about. So I just, I just started watching it and I was just like, as I'm watching it, I'm like, okay, wow, this is kind of crazy. So here's the premise of the documentary. It, it begins in March of 2012 in Miami. All right. And it's about, it starts off essentially, once it gets to the actual story portion, it starts off with an older woman, probably in her 40s, invites a young pool boy, he's 20 years old, so this woman is more than twice his age, invites her to her hotel room, but she tells the dude that, oh, by the way, my husband is going to be there and he likes to watch this stuff. So the kid... He's the one, he's the one who the, it's, it's primarily him and his sister who are giving the perspectives about what happened. And so he does a good job filling out like what he was thinking and what happened and all this kind of stuff. And so he says, you know, so he decided to do it. His sister was like, you're crazy. What are you doing? This is madness. Cause he doesn't come from that. I think he, I think later on in the documentary, I think one of the investigative he's reporters Catholic, that Catholic broke the background. story. Yeah, Catholic, but he said, this guy never even had a girlfriend in high school, right? right so this is, right. he's just handsome kid, brand spanking new, right? No no relationship background or anything. And he goes up to this woman's hotel room and her husband's going to be there watching this thing. She seduced him. Yeah, she seduced him. And he said that in the thing. And it was the way, he has text messages. He has all this stuff put together, right? So um, when they're done, the next couple days, he gets an email from them with pictures, and then he finds out that the couple, he didn't even know who they were. And actually, when he forwarded the email to his sister, it was a picture of him and the woman, and then him and the husband. And he forwarded it to his sister, and his sister was like, wait a minute, I know that last name. And she said, isn't that the, isn't his dad like a pastor or something? And she right. was like, I don't know. And so he Googles Jerry Falwell and finds out, oh, wow, that was Jerry Falwell Jr. and his wife, Becky Falwell. So yeah. then it's like, okay, so here are the, here's the president of Liberty University, largely the most popular Christian college in the nation. All right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's really interesting to watch this play out. So... He finds out, wow, this is Jerry Falwell, and this is his wife, Becky. And then it goes into this, um, it goes on a journey, if you will, right? It goes on a journey, and then he starts talking about they begin flying him to different places. Right. And he's just hooking up with this woman and, um, you know, all this stuff happening. You know, well, I one mean, of the granted, things, this is the largest Christian college in the U.S. Right. I was just going to say, right. it, one of the things that made it, you know, makes this thing so crazy is what they call the Liberty Way, which my right. brother was privy to. My brother graduated from Liberty University. So right, yeah. I remember hearing the details about the Liberty Way and all the things that they could not do, all the limitations, you know, with alcohol, with how what dorms you could be in and what time, what movies you could watch, what you couldn't watch. Like, there was so many restrictions in order to produce, quote unquote, you know, good Christian living. Yeah. In light yeah. of this. And they broke every rule. Every rule. Every rule. They broke yeah. every rule. A bit in spades, right? Like, I mean, yeah. in spades. Like, like, like here, here's the line, and they just went way over. I mean, they yeah, went I mean my three, man was walking around with water bottles with vodka in them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, just, just getting smashed on camera. This president, this Jerry Falwell's son. Right. The guy who started the moral majority, the Christian right, what right. now is the so anyway, we've got we've we talked about all that in the previous episode. We're gonna stay stay focused. All right, so 
So they begin flying this kid around the country. He's, you know, in a relationship with Becky Falwell. It's crazy that this is happening. And then they start, you know, promising this kid real estate investments. They have money, they have power. And he's just talking about how it's like, wow, these people are powerful. They're inviting them to these things where there's thousands of people there. And they're all like praising Jerry Falwell. And he's thinking, man, I'm intimate with this guy's wife and he's watching, but he's up here talking to all these people as if he's, so it was kind of weird for him to see this, but he was attracted, he was young, he was 20 years old. He was attracted to the power and stuff like that. Well, eventually they, they meet, he gets to meet Donald Trump, which was his, like one of his personal heroes. Because at the time, this is 2012, Donald Trump. Yeah, he wanted to be president. a real estate guy. He wanted, yeah, he wanted to be a real estate time guy. Real estate. He read one of Donald Trump's books. And so he met Donald Trump. He signed it. And you see, now when I'm saying this, these aren't all just, he's just telling the story. You see the photos. You right. see the text messages. Yep. You hear voicemails and conversations. So this is all like, it's well done. I, I was amazed sense. at some of the stuff that they had, that they showed. I was like, yeah. what the world? Man. I was like, wow, this is insane, right? So they, he meets Donald Trump and he's just like, man, but then he realizes, look, I don't, this isn't a good thing. Like I don't, you know, they give him an investment property for a couple million down in Miami, four million, four million dollars. He's running yeah. this thing. Like they're, yeah. they're basically buying him. Like he felt like they're trying to basically control my life through these gifts and these things and making the him stay in a relationship with Becky Fallon. So all of that stuff is happening. And then here's how it all comes out. Here's how the cards all fall down. Some couple of years later, the cards fall down because he has a friend who has a dad that's corrupt. And his friend, friend uh, eight, eight years later, it's eight years later. So, yeah. This is, so yeah, yeah, this is 2020. Right. So, well, the deal was before that. The deal yeah, was yeah, before the deal that. Was way before that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, you're right. The but, deal was like 15 or something like that. Yeah, it's 2015, like something like that. So it was, in, it, but in 2020, so this is eight years now of living in this sexual relationship yeah. with the first lady of Christian colleges, right? Uh, Becky Falwell. This is insane, right? So uh, he had he had gotten to a real estate deal with his friend, but his dad was like a real... He was a real sinful dude and owed all these people money. So his his dad and his friend, they started to figure out something's up. And they put it together and somehow they got pictures. I don't know how they... I, I don't even know if it remembers how they got the photos. Right? I, I don't think they revealed it, but I'd yeah. imagine they probably got a private investigator and somebody yep. just watched them and started taking yep. shots. Yep. You know, so I, they got pictures of him and Becky Falwell. So they but, basically tried to blackmail Jerry Falwell. It's interesting because even the kid later on brought... I say kid, but he's a grown man now. But yeah, Now he is. He, yeah. he brought out later that, you know... Um, the whole like uh, people would make fun of Becky because she wasn't around. So it was something right, that people yeah. knew yeah. something was odd. So it wouldn't yeah. have been hard for these guys to catch wind of something funny yeah. going on. I mean, on. It, listen, these the, the Falwells were bringing this dude around their family. Every, they had I mean, three they were, children. Yeah, they were they acting were, like their kids were siblings with him. Yeah, they were bringing this dude around. He was getting invited to weddings and all these functions. And then he would just disappear with Becky Falwell and be it, it, you know in a sinful sexual relationship while all everyone else was like, where's mom? But leaving so Falwell a, Jr. to entertain everyone. Yeah, right, right. He was covering for his wife. Like, this is insane, right? This yeah, is, yeah. This is all documented. Like, you can see this stuff. So, so the way it comes out is they try to blackmail this other guy. This The guy, his name is Giancarlo. Giancarlo is the, is the, is the pool boy who was in a relationship with Becky Falwell. He has another guy that's a friend of his, but this guy's not really a friend. And the friend's dad was a corrupt dude. They blackmailed Jerry Falwell. And then uh, Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's, uh, an associate of Donald Trump, gets involved, tells it. Jerry Falwell that he'll fix it. He'll fix the issue. And all of a sudden, the problem goes away, they said. It's just gone. It just disappears. Like, these guys aren't asking him. He didn't know what happened exactly, but not. he said for a while, those guys were just gone. They just disappeared. So there was, there, he thinks there, I think he said there was some kind of payoff or something that he thought may have happened, right? Who knows? It's Michael Cohen. Now, Michael Cohen has had some issues legally in the, so we know about Michael Cohen. But this, to this him, in the documentary, no one really knew who Michael Cohen was. Right. Because he was sort of a like, background figure on the Trump's He was what they, what government like officials call a fixer. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, he was yeah, a fixer. Like, we well know said. what that is. Yeah, he's a fixer. All right. 
So he gets involved, and then the, then the whole thing disappears. But then Michael Cohen tells, apparently, this is all, again, this is Giancarlo, this is his story, right? But he's But he has a lot of receipts to back it up. But I can't say, I'm not saying everything he said is true, but I'm telling you his story. So he said that Michael Cohen handled the situation, kept those guys quiet who were trying to blackmail Jerry Falwell, but then said as a favor for doing that, that Jerry Falwell needs to endorse Donald Trump because he's going to run for president. And they were like, no, are you serious? He's going to do that? And it was like, yeah, he's going to run for president, right? Yep. And so Jerry Falwell became the main evangelical Christian. He let Trump kind of speak at the college, at Christian Liberty, at Liberty. And he became, in a sense, the, the main evangelical, the first and one that kind of people rallied around to endorse Trump's candidacy for president. Yeah, I mean, not only not only did he let Trump speak, but I need I think we need to we need to just expand on that a little bit. So when yeah. you talk about the convocation at Liberty University, like this is a weekly event that they do where everyone must be there. Yeah, like, three of these three times a week you have yeah, to all, come to all the speeches. students must be there. Yeah, you know, that's there's a no there's no there's no question about it. So he took his biggest platform and said, here, Trump, you can have it and address mm -hmm. all that that's I have right. authority over. Here yeah. you go. You know what I'm saying? That's what he yeah. did. So he gave him his platform, basically. Yeah. Big deal. It's, big it's deal. a huge platform. I mean, you're talking about the biggest Christian college in America. In America. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, right. Arguably, huge maybe platform. even the world. I don't you know, know it's where funny else. because... So remember when Trump won the first time? And this isn't a political conversation. I'm not... I don't... I'm not... I'm, I, I trust the sovereignty of God for who's politics president, right? are always involved, but yeah, yeah but this but this but this, but this is this isn't like a like I'm not on the left going after Trump when I say this, right, thing, right. But it's just it's it was interesting was remember when the when the report came out that 81 percent of evangelicals voted for Trump. You remember that? Oh yeah, I remember Shai's reaction and remember that? Yeah, Shai debacle. tweeted something and yeah. he took it down because people yeah. were like, "Hey, brother, would you?" But it was like, "Whoa, wow, what's going on here?" It makes more sense to me now because I was thinking. Man, why are they going? Why are they going to put it on just the believers? Like, man, there was a lot of people in Appalachia that voted for Trump too, like because True. he was promising them, you know, make America great again. Man, bringing coal mines back to the blue collars. And yeah, yeah. He did. It was a good. It was strategic to not say what great again meant, so everyone had their own version of it and believed that that's what he was going to do. He's a businessman, fam. He's a hustler, and I, yep. I, 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 in that sense, I respect that. Right? That yep. was a good slogan. It was a good slogan. Black Lives Matter was a good slogan. It was a good slogan. I mean, there's, there's, sometimes you just got to just do it. It's a good slogan. Sometimes, yeah. man, that slogan yeah. is, is means yeah. something, you know? That's right. Yeah, right. I'm loving it. Right, right. It's a good slogan, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, so Trump, you know, he says he endorsed him. And so it shows him just basically endorsing Trump. And then obviously Trump wins the 2016 election and becomes president for the 45th president, right? So it talks about all of that. And then eventually... This kid was like, look, man, these people like have me and I need to break away from this. So he decides, I'm going to tell my story. He tells the paper, his story, right before they're about to print it. Jerry Falwell told a different version of the narrative, kind of made himself a victim mm -hmm. that his wife was like. Well, there was a, a there was a, a journalist that was exposing it. He was starting to expose starting a lot expose, of stuff. Yeah. So he so Jean Carlo, whatever his name is, tried to jump ahead of the gun. He was like, oh, well, I'm going to put my story out there right. before they lie. And Falwell right. just tried to act as if, though, he was having an affair with Becky, and that's all that was going on. He had right. no parts. Mm -hmm. And this guy had some crazy evidence. Crazy evidence, fam. Fam. And so he had crazy evidence to prove that this was not. So so Jerry Falwell puts his story out there. He's a victim. He throws his wife under the bus. I'm, I, I didn't Google this. I'm curious if they're still married. He threw, now, here's the thing. I heard about all of that. Like I didn't. I, that's when I heard. I was like, "Wow, these panels are wilding right now." I heard about all of that because you got to remember. I don't know exactly when. I don't know exactly when, Ravi Zacharias' situation happened in, in terms of the timing, right? But I just remember thinking, like, "Wow, man, these people are wilding." Like this is. Jerry it was Falwell. close to the same time, but I think Falwell's might have been first now, thinking back. Because I remember yeah. telling you earlier today that I don't remember hearing about this mm -hmm. because I hadn't heard much about it because of what I was 
consumed with. So I was listening to your JD Halls. I was listening to a lot of the, you know, uh, discernment bloggers who would be right. more on the conservative yeah. end, you know, mm-hmm. like more conservative extremist type stuff. So, right, yeah. so they definitely wouldn't have been talking about the fall of Jerry Falwell. You know, it wouldn't have been any beneficial and right. beneficial because that, that would have so. been connected to Trump and they're voting for Trump, all that right. stuff. Right. Like. So it's really fascinating when you watch sort of this happen. And so. Jerry Falwell puts out this narrative and then eventually it starts to get debunked that this isn't really true. And then Giancarlo's narrative comes out and then it becomes boom. He's able to clear his name and all that stuff. I don't know where he is now or what he's doing. I remember hearing about this on the tail end. Obviously, I wouldn't have the knowledge of all the background stuff until you watch the doc. But I remember hearing about him just being disappointed. And and it was and it, honestly for Strack, Strack will probably remember this. Most of you may not, but it was one of it was another for me. So most people don't believe this because I'm a black dude. I'm from the, I'm from the streets. They're still I'm, married, I'm by the way. Big dude. According... I got I got huh? They're still married. I, just, oh, they I are. looked okay, it good. up. They are still. Yeah, they good are for still them. Married. Good for them. Good for them. Um, I think most people think I'm just intuitively a Democrat. I've never voted Democrat in my life, even though I, I challenge the conservatives probably more. But it, so people think they call me woke and I'm on the left, but I'm not. I'm not that at all. I didn't support Black Lives Matter, the organization at all but I understood the sentiment of the hashtag, right? I understood that. I'm real, like I'm not real. I'm not I'm not motivated by political ambition or who's president. I trust God's sovereignty for those things. I, I, it's, it's, I'm it's. i waiting for the new heavens and new earth, right? And I'll try to be faithful in this one. So I'm not drawn by that, but even though people just call me woke because it's just easier to say that because they don't like the fact that I challenge it. But one of the reasons why I challenge the conservative side is because of stuff like this. Mm-hmm is because of the hypocrisy in these things that come out. And so as I'm watching the documentary, this stuff becomes like, wow, these are the people who who claim to have the moral high ground, right? That's so crazy. The left is the people who are baby killers and all this other stuff, right? And it's the right who has all the moral, we love God, we love the Bible. So when you see this happening, and again, you can't blame what Jerry and Becky Falwell did on all conservatives even. No, 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 no. I have a lot of good friends who are conservatives and and I and I love them. And they some of them go to my church. I love them. And so it's not it's not that. But it's just like you realize like, wow, this is I was like, man, Lord, you are really going after it right now. Hmm. You're just exposing all this stuff. And I and I remember back then I started thinking like, you know, it's really interesting because if you play the political game, you'll think like the you'll hear from the right, oh, you know. They're damaging your Christian witness because you vote Democrat and all these things, right? And the world is going to look at you and say, and I was thinking like, man, I, you know, I'm curious. Like, I wonder, I have some non-Christian friends so I can bounce this stuff off of them, but I wonder what scandals like this do to the world as they think about Christianity. Like, I feel like. Yeah. What Jerry Falwell did, what Ravi Zacharias did, and then you got the SBC earlier this year, right? Huge sex abuse scandal for years. I mean, that was that that, that movie just came out too with um uh what's Ted Ted something or uh remember him and his pet him and his wife the real funny looking one lady that she always had to make up. Oh yeah 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 um um Baker the Jim Baker Baker story. yeah yeah that, that was story. just that was huge too that and huge that just too. dropped this past year. Right, and so you think about like when you hear like. When you think about what has done the most damage to the reputation of Christianity, is it people getting offended and supporting a movement that people burn a Walmart up when a black person gets killed? Like, I don't, I don't know. And then you think about this, like, you look at the dynamics and think, well, man, to whom much is given, much is required, right? Mm-hmm. So if you are the moral high ground people and you say you got the values of the Lord and you're fighting and then all this stuff is happening. And then the people who are support that don't call it out. Right. Right. We said this a couple of weeks ago, that if Candace Owens and them really cared about you're exposing the fraud of black lives matter, that's already been exposed. But if you really cared about fraud, then why would you not say anything about Donald Trump? Like, why would you not say anything about the fraud that he's been exposed of? Like I'm, and this isn't a political statement. Um, I just think like I've never I, I just don't vote I, I've never voted Democrat so this is a political but this is like if you really care if you're really a believer right the, re, the believers have Ephesians five eleven expose the deeds of darkness mm-hmm. not expose the deeds of darkness on the side that you 
disagree with politically, right? That's good. Expose the D. So I don't care what wherever darkness is, I'm exposing him. This is why me and Strack a couple of years ago started using the mantra "Stay Balanced," mm -hmm. and people got offended and think we're trying to be neutral. No, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not picking a side because I think both sides there's darkness there, and yeah. once you lose sight, and once you choose a side, you're not allowed to expose the darkness on your side. It's just a given rule, right? I think the the bomb dropper when you when you consider what you're talking about as far as who is the the bigger um, maybe plight on Christianity. If you have two groups and one group is living what they're professing, though what they're professing may be contested by the rest of the body of Christ, mm -hmm. um, or maybe by a majority or, or by a good portion of it, right? Right. Um, but they live by what they're confessing. Um, and then you have another side who doesn't live by what they profess, also has an issue with a lot, with a good body, a good portion of the body of Christ, but has a huge following, especially like the conservative side. And they live hypocritically, mm. meaning they're not living by what they confess. I mean, who do you think is going to have more of an issue? Like, who who is going to cause more of a damage to the witness of the body? The one mm. who is actually living what they're saying or the one who is living the opposite of what they're saying? Right. I mean, that's what you have to ask yourself. Reg regardless of where you stand on, you know, socialism, wokeness, or whatever the case may be, yeah. conservatism, you know, Republican, Democrat, you have to ask whatever. yourself, who is going to cause more damage? The one who confesses and walks what they confess or the one who confesses and lives the opposite of what they confess but still requires people under their authority to live what they confess. And that's what I feel like the Lord is exposing. And I think what's right. sad to me is that they just don't see that. They don't seem to own it. Yeah. Everything becomes, a for them, a leftist narrative, right? This is, oh, the media, the leftist media. It's like, nah, right. fam. There's no media outlet that made Becky Falwell commit adultery. <laughs> you know, I think I think I'm not necessarily going to stand in, in disagreement with saying that there isn't a leftist agenda. Right. So right. is there an agenda to tear down the church? Sure. I think there's always an agenda to tear down the church. Satan's job is to do that. That's what he desires to do is tear down the church. And anybody who can, he can influence and take captive to do his bidding, he's going to do so. But you, you got to look at the bigger picture of everything going on. I mean, look at the damage that this does to the body yeah. when they live contrary completely to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Now, and to be clear, I'm glad you said that. I'm not saying there's no leftist agenda. I just think I don't blame everything on the leftist agenda. Right. right? Yeah. I don't blame. It's like someone, it, it, you know what that's like to me? It would be like you commit adultery someone caught you and tells other people then it gets out and then you start talking right. about people gossiping about you right right fam is it true is the question like yeah. okay whether they gossiped or not did you do this yes it, who, you don't need you don't need the leftist the agenda if you're setting up your own traps 100 percent. there's no leftist agenda you know you what don't I'm need like, them to me they, they're going to expose it of course they're going to highlight it and maybe ignore what they do so again it's the same thing they both do the same thing it's really fascinating to watch this but now, so having said all of that, some of you may be like, okay, what does this have to do with I'm not growing as a Christian? What, what are you talking about, right? Here's the deeper concern, right? So you got the documentary exposing the, um, the fakeness, I'll use that word, of at least Jerry Falwell, and he's an influential guy. So, so now let's step away from just what the documentary did. Let's go a layer deeper. You know, we just let's cross examine what we just talked about. Let's go a layer deeper here, right? There's a bigger problem that affects all of us. And this is where we come into the picture. This is where we now are sort of in the scene with the Falwells, right? You know, last week we talked about this. I made this statement last week that grace doesn't lower the standard of holiness. It forgives us for not keeping it. I've said that before and so forth. And I, I stand by that. I believe that. But there's another side to this. When you watch Jerry Falwell and then Becky, and then you think about other Christian leaders or just Christians in general, and, and, and even down to just the what we would call the theological Christian who is gung-ho about all of this stuff, right? About politics and the, and the state of the country. When you get down to that... There, when you watch this documentary, you realize something insane, right? 
<laughs> these people either are oblivious to the fact that they're going to stand before God and give an account. Or they don't care. Or they really think that grace is so amazing that you can sin and do all these things and keep doing them and there are going to be no consequences for your actions. And as I was that's watching anti, that's the antinomianism. documentary. Huh? That's antinomianism. 100%. But they're not ready for that old school heresy, right? But 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 I, as I was watching the documentary, I was thinking to myself, wow, there are things that I don't do because I don't want to stand before God and have to acknowledge that I did that. Right. Right? There's We're tempted in various ways, right? Tempted to do a lot of things, right? And I think, and again, I can't prove this from the scriptures per se, but I do think when you're a pastor... I think the enemy does work a little bit harder because if he strikes the, you know, you strike the under shepherd, then the sheep scatter, right? I mean, how many people have had their pastor in some scandal and when it comes out, they end up leaving the church, the church they were in and then sometimes Christianity, right? right. So I think you're under even more stress as a pastor because, you know, I was telling my friend who's a police officer, right? My friend's a cop and we were having lunch one day and I said, you know what, bro? Me and you both see people in some of their worst moments. You see more non-Christians in criminal elements. I see Christians in, in, in sinful elements. And I said, you know what's different though? I said, you could be a terrible husband, a horrible day. You could be, hit your, you could do all these things and still get employee of the month as a cop. Because your character, personal character doesn't matter to them. As long as you're making arrests and you're not, you know, breaking the law too, you know, too often or at all that they can, you're, you, you're good. I said, good me point. though, if I don't have a good relationship, if my, if my house isn't in order, if my, I got to step down potentially, right? Or there's, yeah. there's going to be some, so I, 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 I was thinking like, you know, there are times when, when you're a religious leader as a pastor. Not part of this challenge of being a pastor, for me, it's not preaching, it's not all, it's your own personal example. You have to maintain that and you have struggles like everyone else. You you get angry like everyone else. You feel yeah. underappreciated. You struggle with bitterness. You struggle with pornography. You struggle with, you know, lack of self-control. All these things, like pastors are not exempt. Religiously, nah. they're not exempt. It's like, we have to, but we have to fight through them in ways that other people don't have to. And so as I was watching the documentary, I thought, wow. And I wasn't trying to say it self-righteously. Oh, please, no. I'm not saying it's self-righteous at all. I got many flaws. And again, some of the people that left my church left because some of those flaws. Fine with that. I get it. We're, we're all work in progress. But I just thought, wow, these dudes are really wilding right now. Like this dude, does he not think, does Jerry Falwell not think that he's going to stand before the Lord and give an account, like his salvation may be in question because of this, what he's doing, all of this. So as I'm watching this, I realized, and me and Strack were talking about this, there's a much deeper concern that all of us need to pay attention to based on, we're gonna use a documentary as, as, as sort of a, a catalyst, right? And there's a verse that I want to want to want to read is that this is clearly what was happening with Jerry Falwell, Becky, and other people. Who Proverbs one seven says, "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction." And it was so evident from watching the documentary that these people do not fear the Lord. And I was just thinking, like, I wonder why. Do, are they really just straight up and down that deceived because of the strike? You brought up the power component, right? Yeah. You brought, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Cause I had a different angle. You had the power component. Yeah. So my, my mind came more from the greed aspect. Right. Uh, you know, my wife and I were, were just sitting on Proverbs one this morning and um, you know, it's funny that you read from it obviously, but uh, from the green standpoint, like, you know, the world sets traps and they tell you, come with us, let's set this trap up. And they're really setting traps for themselves to capture their own blood. Um, yeah. And I think that's what happens, you know, when you talk about somebody who, 
uh, is so caught up in their own stuff. They're preaching one way. They're living. They're they're saying things one way publicly. They're functioning this way while they're doing all these things behind the scenes. They're setting traps for themselves, you know. Yeah. And the the thing is that they're doing things to cover their own sin, their own wickedness that will involve the detriment of others. You know what I'm saying? So they they didn't care about this guy. You know, they they just no, wanted they to use him to get yeah, whatever they, they could from him. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're, you know, not only are they taking someone who, you know, we don't know how innocent this, this young man was. I mean, a according to the documentary, he was not sexual. So they took his, his prior sexuality. Prior to his relationship with Becky. Prior Fox. to his relationship yeah. with her. Um, and, and even the introduction of it, if you if you remember, she talks about only doing, um, you know, not going all the way. Yeah, basically. it wasn't. Yeah, in right. the first in the first account. Of, yeah, yeah, the first account. There was there was only supposed to do certain things. Um, so just all of that, like easing into it, you know, the way she did, like all, it was setting a trap. You know what I'm saying? Really like was. really, it really was. You were capturing was someone from, from problems, for your right? own. Just, yes. I mean, on top of that, yes. On, crazy. Even this, yes, the, the adulterous woman, like, mm, you know, you're wow. setting a trap and really ultimately you, you were, you, the trap is for yourself. Because yeah. the Lord does not let the wicked go unpunished, you know, so you will get caught within your own trap and your own snares. And that's what we see happen. I mean, mm -hmm. and it is an, an issue, uh, the way we view the church, the way America views the church. I'm always talking about how I think, you know, America at some point is going to reverse the way Christianity should be viewed. And they're going to say, this is the way Christianity is supposed to be, like societies have done throughout history. I mean, every nation that has taken over and conquered, they've said, Christianity is a power source. We have to tap into that. Let's oh, make it right. ours so that we can control it. Yep. That's, I mean, it, it's going to be the same Eli. way here. It's the same way here. You know oh, what I'm saying? Right. Book of Eli, exactly. And, and you know, we see how life has imitated art constantly yeah, you know right. in america with cinema cinema cine, cinematography right, right. Yeah. alone you know what i'm saying so when you talk about these images where these powerful leaders of the probably the most powerful religion in the world right throughout history yeah. Yeah. um and they fall and then you're like okay this is the mind of 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 People trying to reestablish America and get rid of Christianity as we know it today, right? People who would be hating God and do not want anything to do with God. So the mindset would be, well, we can recreate what Christianity should be. Because look at the top tier dudes who we've known. I mean, they keep on falling and plummeting. Yeah. How hard is it going to be for someone else to rise up and say, no, 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 no. They've had it all wrong. Because even they will say, like Falwell in the, in the video himself, Oh, I had it all wrong when I was preaching on segregation. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, so yeah. the so, dad did. The dad said. Right. This. The dad did. So they're yeah. they're acknowledging their faults, their flaws, or they're being exposed for them, mm -hmm. and they're being put at the forefront. And this stuff is attractive enough that people look at it and they're like, "Yo, Christianity's jacked up." You know what right. I'm saying? This ain't like Jesus was cool, but these dudes. So present another Jesus. One hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? 100 percent, bro. Because people right still gonna follow Jesus. They will. They're gonna follow. I mean, Jesus. he's he's the popular. Jesus, though. Yeah. So all right. So I, I appreciate that, and I thought that was a good angle. So here's the angle I'm coming from, and this is where you, the listener, are concerned. Here's what I my broader concern for myself and for all of us, pivoting off of watching this documentary. Here was the concern, and I'll sum it up in this statement. The lack of immediate consequences for sin convince people that there are no consequences for sin. That's good. That's good. Yep. And I was That's watching because you think about it. So this this relationship started in 2012 and lasted for eight years. Hmm. So initially there was all this trepidation and fear. And what if we get caught? We got to be careful. And then, then all of a sudden they're at restaurants. She's all touching the dude. And he's thinking like, oh, man, ain't somebody going to notice this? They're not even true. There was, I, I think among us, there is a lack of immediate consequences, which I would mm -hmm. call grace on one level. Oh, yeah. There's a lack of immediate consequences for sin that condition us to think there are no consequences for it. Right? Yeah. 
And and I remember, and this is maybe a, a horrible example, right? But I remember watching this Christian movie. It was a it was one of it was one of those campy Christian movies where the kid was a Christian in a college classroom, and the professor was an atheist, and he said he had a glass of water on the corner of a desk, and he said, "All right, if your God is real, then tell him to stop this glass from breaking when I push it off." Something like that. And then he slowly does it, and the kid's praying. He's on. And then the glass breaks, right? And then the guy's like, see, there's no God. There's no comfort, you know. And the scripture talks about there's no fear of God in their eyes, right? There's a sense where I think within us, all believers, the immediate, the lack of immediate consequences sometimes can make us think there are none. Mm-hmm. Now, let me, let me connect this back to what we said last week. I think one of the things that we have to watch out for is that we think there's no immediate consequence for not wanting to go back to church or not wanting to serve in my church, not resisting particular temptations, not having a desire to read. Like, I think the Bible does not say what I'm about to say, what I'm about to say right now. I can't prove it. But I think every Christian has the responsibility to cultivate an endless fascination with the Bible. Right, because the Bible is God's word, so it's an endless fascination with God. That's right. what I'm after. I want to cultivate an endless fascination with God. Yeah. And and so I think that we think there's no immediate consequences for just leaving churches, not going to your small group, not fellowshipping with people. We don't notice any because we think of consequences as I'm gonna lose my job. I'm gonna get sick. I'm gonna drop day. We we think we I, I think Christians and I can't prove this. I'm just as you know you know what this is right. Mm-hmm. That's my last qualification. I think we have an Ananias and Sapphira view of consequences, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, Acts five. They they don't bring the money to the thing, and then they just boom drop dead, and this is shock and awe. That was like the first shock and awe, right? Right. Shock and awe in the New Testament. Go, whoa, God's not playing. I think we think of consequences like that and we don't think of like a lack of desire to read the Bible, a lack of desire to pray or to resist sin. That's the thing is a lack of growth doesn't allow you to acknowledge the consequences. 100%. 100%. And so I think we, I think with Jerry Falwell, I think he thought there's no immediate consequences. I'm still the president of the most, I have all this power. I got Donald Trump elected. Junior. I got Donald Trump elected, like my dad. My dad got Ronald Reagan elected. Look at this. Right. He used that in a speech. Yeah, he he said that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like he's killing the game. There are no, and I think what happens is when you think there are no immediate consequences, you forget like stuff like 2 Peter 3, 9, that God is not slow concerning his promises, right? But he desires that all would repent. So the lack of immediate consequences, even in heinous sins like adultery, right? are really God's mercy in giving people time to work out their salvation in fear, in fear and trembling. Yeah. And I think that we don't think that there are consequences because I think we think consequences are these great big things. And so if I am not trying to grow, not doing these things, if I, if I just go to church and I sit there and I'm just critical of what I'm seeing and hearing, we don't think there's consequences for right, that because right, they're not right. always immediate or we don't understand that incremental consequences for believers are going to look more like a lack of desire for the means of grace that God right. has provided. A yeah, lack but, of desire. There's things like see, there's things I can say, but then there's people who are hawking the podcast, waiting for me to say something so they can right. think I'm talking about them. Well, I, if I'll I don't have then. relationships with people all over the country and talking about other situations. But, but again, I think there is a lack of of really a pre- and I've seen it happen in my church and out of my church. There's a lack of immediate consequences, right? You slowly give in to like lust and you just think like, man, it's not that there's no immediate consequence. You still love your wife, you still do this all all of a sudden well I mean three this years is- later, you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm in love with another woman. I don't know how I got here. I, you know, there's consequences that aren't immediate. And I think we think that in the grand scheme they're not. I mean, how, how did Rocky, Rocky, I mean, again, I don't know Robbie Zuckerberg, but how did you teach all this stuff and do all this and talk about how great God and then do all these things and think like, what did you think was going to happen when you died and stood before the Lord? 
Mm-hmm. Now, granted, don't get me wrong. Grace will forgive us. For, don't get me wrong. That's not. I'm not legally saying there's like, but there's a sense where man, you're just willfully. There's a verse, second First Timothy five twenty four and twenty five. This is a really fantastic verse. Before you go there, I don't want to lose my thought. You go ahead. So, my thought is dealing with um, God's severity and and qu- swiftness with consequence. And and I'll come back to this because I have a story that I want to share that we talked about earlier. But mm, real quick, mm, yeah. real quick, the the what is the consequence of sin? What is the wage of sin? The wage mm. of sin is death. Yeah. So w- I think we've dumbed down or limited, maybe in a sense, what the ultimate consequence is, mm. because we've we've taken what we see temporarily and we've made it greater than what we don't see eternally. Mm. Just like. Just like, just like, you know, we're told what is temporal, you know, what, what, what's seen as temporal, what's unseen as eternal. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same thing with the consequence. What's seen as temporal, what's unseen as eternal. Mm-hmm. The consequence is, falls under the same mm-hmm. truth. Yes. So when, when Adam and Eve died at the garden, the consequence wasn't immediate, well, immediate. death physically. The consequence was separation from God. Right. That was the death. Which was the ultimate death that cross the cross conquered. Mm-hmm. Christ conquered at the cross. Yeah, so when you have Ananias and Sapphira come in and do their thing, it's like, yo, mm-hmm. check it. God still does this. Right. Don't forget. Right. But we're also in a different period now where the Lord's grace is somewhat. I know I sound like a dispensationalist right now, yes. but I'm just saying. Where the Lord's grace is experienced in a different way because just like the sacrifice on a yearly basis covered the sins of the multitudes that were covered in it that were with israel the cross covered until judgment you know what i'm saying like yeah until judgment the cross made it oh listen the cross made it appeasable to god to a certain degree his son just suffered death on the cross Mm. for sin like i mean if if the yearly sacrifice of the high priest who was just as sinful as everyone else could cover the sins of the people for a year wow. until they came back. You're going to tell me that the cross can't cover the world until the Lord judges eternally? Mm, mm, we mm. got to think about that differently. Man, y'all better start paying tithes this episode because Pastor Wolverine is preaching. <laughs> y'all better go ahead and hit that, that cash app, that Venmo or subscribe. I just Patreon. think we don't, we don't weigh the, the weightiness of the cross and the weightiness of the consequence of sin and death. You know what I'm saying? We don't no, we just don't we just don't weigh them in comparison to what is temporal. Well, I think that's the thing. So I wonder if to to go with what you're saying, this idea that like n- removal away from the presence of God is not something that people think is a bad thing, right? So it makes me wonder why would you want to be in heaven then when you're going to fully be in the presence of God? This is what I don't understand. Like if you don't enjoy the presence of God on earth, why do you think you're going to enjoy it for eternity in heaven? Mm. And that's where I think like, man, we we're living here now to prepare to live there forever. So heaven's I'm not heaven if he's not there, now, right? Huh? Heaven's not heaven if he's not there, right? Yeah. Right. We're creating habits now that we're going to exponentially do in eternity, right? And do them perfectly, perfect in eternity. <laughs> so when sin. I when I when I watch when I'm thinking about this, I just think like, I think we should be. So look, there's a verse, First Timothy five twenty four twenty five says this. This is a crazy verse. It says the sins of some people are conspicuous. It means obvious, right? Going before them to judgment. But the sins of others appear later, right? Hmm. So also good works are conspicuous, even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Hmm. Right? Interesting verse. So here it says, there are some people's sins are obvious. So you think of a guy like a Hitler or maybe a Osama bin Laden, just crazy stuff, right? It says it's, their sins are so obvious, their sins are going before them to the judgment, right? Mm. But then there are, but other, the sins of others appear later, mm. right? So their sins show up, their consequences show up much later, 
Mm-hmm. And I and I think that as believers, particularly coming from the post COVID era, I think we have to be honest about man. What do I have? A a immediate consequences complex, right? If do I have an Ananias and Sapphira view of consequences, where if there's no immediate devastating consequences, then I'm just forgiven and I can just keep doing what I'm doing. And I think that's what Jerry Falwell was doing and Becky. Dangerous for any believer to do this, to think like the lack of immediate consequences means there are none. And the reason why is because we have verses like Matthew 7, right? Right. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right. Many will say to me on that day, there are con- what was the consequence for them? They didn't believe in Jesus, though. They'll say, didn't I? Yeah. Didn't I? Right. All didn't the things I? I did for you, right? <laughs> won't, 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 won't. So there's a sense where the Bible makes it clear. Oh, woe to you Pharisees. You tithe mint and cumin, and but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. You should have done both of them, you know? You go all this way to make one convert, and then you make him twice as likely to go to hell before mm-hmm. he got saved in the way that you tell him to live, right? I think all believers can learn from the Falwells and this, I'm not saying go watch the documentary. It's not, it's not a Christian documentary. It's talking about a Christian family. But I think we can all learn from them that there are consequences. Now God let eight years, this is the thing that's crazy to me, right? This happened for eight years, right? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe the first year or two, you think like, man, something might happen. But then after that, when there's no consequences, you just are like chilling. You know, the thing was, is it was almost exposed a few times, though. It, like was, it, it almost was, came almost, out yeah. a few times. So mm-hmm. that almost gave them like a little bit more confidence. Untouchable, right? You know what I'm saying? Off the Al Capone untouchable tip, right? I mean, to it's the just... point where, yo, know, the whole idea that they had, he had relationship with the kids. That was crazy, bro. And they, but they were sexually active in the kids' bedroom. That's like, crazy. Remember his wife? So there's a scene where the guy had part of his evidence. Oh, that was that, the that was the great evidence. That was yeah. the great evidence. Yeah, Becky yeah, Falwell yeah. was walking around on a FaceTime call. And I don't know how he filmed this, but he was walking around on a face. She's walk and she's not dressed. She's naked and showing him all of the rooms that they had sexual. Well, he was on FaceTime with her, so he must have just been recording the FaceTime. Yeah, no, but the way he showed it, they showed his face watching the phone though. So he he must have, I mean, that's what I'm saying. He might have had a camera recording it, but the way they did it, it wasn't clear like he had a camera on a tripod holding the phone that way. Right. It was just weird how, but it was it was clearly that. And yeah. then you show Jerry Falwell peep out and went to prove that he was a part of the process. Right, right. right. But when you think about it, it's like, wow. And so, okay, let's get off the Falwells for a second. How many of us genuinely think that way? Like how many of us really think like, I think one of the things we have to do is to, to really flip what we're saying in a really practical way to grow in discernment is we need to evaluate how we view consequences from God and what those are, because they're not, OK, you're not reading your Bible, you're sinning in a secret sin that you're just going to drop dead one day. That could happen, but that's not necessarily the way consequences work. From God, consequences work like you just slowly lose a desire to honor him. Hmm. All of a sudden, you don't feel like going to church anymore. You don't really like the people that you used to love hanging out with. Right. You don't want to serve in the church and you're tired of it. And then and then you wind up people, writing a book called Let There Be Gaslight. Let There Be Gaslight, right? Or you do something like, you know, you just leave the church and maybe you go to a new church. And eventually, this is the thing about going to another church. You're, you're, I tell my church, I've said this before, listen, don't go here if you can't grow here. Like, we get it. I'd rather have people leave and go someplace where they can grow so when they stand before the Lord, they can, rather than be complaining if you don't like something that we're doing. We understand that everyone's going to have preferences. We get that. So don't go here. But, I, but sometimes, but you have to realize that when you leave a church, you're still you. Mm-hmm. Like you're still very much you, whatever you struggle with, whatever you don't like, whatever you, you're still you. Like it's not, you're just going to take you to a new church and maybe you'll be able to thrive in that place. 
But I know of people who go to a new church and are still, they're still critical now of that church. So was it really the worship music? Was it really the pastor's preaching? Was it really this decision to do this? We have to realize that that's what's happening. Like we have to, we have to be aware that like, Hey, if I'm, if I'm losing zeal, right? I'm losing fervor. Second Peter one, nine, he says, look, if you were growing in these qualities, you will never fall. Right. Right. Second Peter one ten says that if you're, if you're, if you grow in these qualities, you will never fall. So if there's a lack of that's desire, a serious promise. Right? You huh? will never fall so if you're never growing fall. in these. So yeah. If you're growing in the qualities that he lists in verses five through seven, right? Says so you'll never fall. So I, sometimes I just think like, man, we're just we're riding on the fumes of grace. Mm-hmm. We're just riding on the fumes of grace and just like, all right. And there's and 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 we don't think that there are consequences for not counting it joy when we suffer, mm-hmm. right? Not not being able to try to act. And it's difficult, don't get me wrong. There are challenges. God knows, he remembers how we are formed and we are only dust. But I think as I watched this documentary, I realized like, wow, when Jesus said like, set your mind on things above and, and to be sober-minded, when Peter warns like, be sober-minded, like there's a sense where the sober-mindedness comes from the fear of the Lord. Right. Like they're just things that like you shouldn't do because you fear the Lord, right? Yeah. There are things that like I'm just not going to do. I've been tempted to do because I don't want to stand before God and give an account for that. I don't want to sin against the Lord in that way. And now granted, there's also ways you just play, man. You just do, right? But there are there are the guardrails of growth, right? There are guardrails of growing. It's not inevitable. It's intentional. There are things that you don't do because you fear the Lord. And I think part of fearing the Lord is to b- truly believe that I will give an account. That I will stand before him, the books will be opened, and I will give an account for my it's life. It's to believe what he said, and that's what mm-hmm. he said will happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, And that's why we said, like, that's why we had the I'm not growing. That's why we're talking about this stuff. Because from my limited vantage point, and this applies to me too, I don't say anything on this show that doesn't apply to me. I have areas in my life, some are obvious that I need to need to go after this more. I don't I, I take all I apply all this stuff as well. But I, I think that I think part of having a fear of the Lord, it's not talking about being afraid of God, like, like when your parents are mad at you, but there's a sense of there's a love and a respect and an understanding that this is God and I'm gonna stand before him one day. And he's going to open up books. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to answer questions about what I did, why I did what I did. Yeah. You know what, what, what helps build that understanding and that, you know, boulder in your brain that remains there mm -hmm. is visiting the God of scripture, continuing to see what he's done throughout history. You're not going to play with the God who can swallow up thousands of people in the earth. (sighs) You're not, you know, you're not, you're not going to play with a God who can do the things he's done throughout history, mm-hmm. you know, who continues to do miraculous and amazing things before Crazy. our eyes. Like, you don't play with that God if you can see him. Mm-hmm. That's the question, though. Do you see him? Can you yeah. hear him truly? So I appreciate this. This is Chris said, church discipline helps in the proper fear as well. It does. You know what I would say? I would say it used to. I don't think church discipline does anymore. It's supposed to. It's supposed to. <laughs> yeah. I think biblically speaking, yes. Paul says, I'm giving them their flesh over to Satan. In this day and age, I don't think church discipline matters. You know why? Because as soon as you put someone on church discipline, they're going to, they're leaving. People don't see when church discipline happened back in the day, people didn't have the variety of communities that they do now. Mm -hmm. You were, you were a part of this community. It was your world. And now you're being disciplined and not being able to access that community or be treated the same because you're living in sin was yeah. part of the impetus for coming back to that community. Nowadays, people will just leave. Yeah, I understand. I get why you're saying that. I mean, it does still work. I've seen it work. No, no, no. And, I'm not know, saying, no, no, yeah. no. When I say these things, I'm not talking about absolute. I'm yeah, saying yeah, yeah. that in this day and age, though, it makes it, it hard. It doesn't yeah, have yeah. the same impact for many people. For many, I know no. people. Yeah. I know people who just leave. Yeah, they just leave churches, and that's the easier thing to do. Yeah, you just leave, and you're not. I'm not going to follow you and know where you went to church and call that pastor. I don't have time to keep up with you where you went. 
Right. I don't, unless the pastor calls me and says, hey, I'm mean, okay, let me tell you who they really are. But a lot of times people don't even have the convict. This is what I mean. When you don't have a conviction to honor the Lord, you don't even think church discipline is something that's good for you. You I mean, see it as, you know, and I mean, some people do. Yeah, somebody, my, pry, somebody prying in your life, in yeah, your life. Yeah. Of course, there are people yeah. who benefit from it. But I think in this day and age, I think there's pro, I think there's a larger group of people who would be unfazed by church discipline, I, I, yeah, especially I coming out of COVID. I agree, especially because people just don't value the relationship that they have with their pastor either. I mean, people right. don't, no, don't. People don't. They don't consider the reality that they're, in, you know, they take charge over mm -hmm. their souls. Mm -hmm. Like they're held accountable by God over their over your soul. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like people don't realize that we're told to make your job easier. Yeah, as no, pastors. people don't listen. Like, if you do, you know, I've never taught this verse ever in scripture. I've I've really ever referred to this verse. But I think, and I can't prove this because it's not happening, this is speculation. I think that people would be offended by this verse today. Here's the verse, Hebrews 13, 17, which Strack is drawing it from. Here's what it says. It says, obey your leaders, obey, mm -hmm. and submit to them, huh? Mm -hmm. For they are keeping watch over your souls That's right. as those who will have to give an account. That's right. That's a serious Let them thing. do this with joy and not with groaning, for That's that right. would be of no advantage to you. Amen. Now, I, mean, I don't know who's yeah. listening, and you can get offended by this statement if you want to. As a pastor, I have definitely had people who have put me in this position and made being groaning, have mm -hmm. put me in a position where it's very difficult to pastor them, and then have blamed me for it. Mm -hmm. I've definitely been like, fam, I'm not, you know, we're pretty easy going. Yeah. And it's like, nah, you don't have this category. Or you have it when it works for you, right? When you like right. what's being said. When I mean, you get challenged though. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, I don't. Really I mean, like this, this is, you know, that's that's where we that's where you can then cling to like First Timothy five twenty five that 100%. even the good works that are not mm -hmm. conspicuous uh, conspicuous will be, will, will be brought will out. Be brought out. They ain't yep. gonna be hidden. You know what yeah. I'm saying? That's what, that's what we cling to. But yeah, I I don't think people really um, like the same way they don't believe that God will truly come back to judge. They, they have a hard time believing that pastors are overseeing our souls you know and that they're yeah. supposed to obey and 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 make their job easier yeah this this is the this is the verse right here that when people come to me like yo you're, you're like pastoral and you're functional like you should consider being a pastor this is the verse right here that always smacks me in the face man. what verse hebrews 13 17 yeah this is it i mean it's, it's like wait hold up <laughs> I got enough with my wife and my kids. I'm not trying to be in charge of y'all souls. Like y'all, yeah. y'all, y'all is a mess. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, act like, yeah, it's so fascinating to me, man. People, and again, I think, I just, I don't know in our day and age if we have given account as a sobering reality. And I would say, even in my Christian life, and even as a pastor, I think I've progressively been growing in how serious that is. Right. Yeah. Which happens, I, happens. I mean, I think as, as you get closer to the Lord, as you, sure. you know, we're, so every day we're like, drawing closer to being with yeah. him. Every, it's like, man, hold on, this is serious, bro. Yeah. Like when I think about Revelation 1, where here's the Apostle John, who's telling, who says in the Gospel of John, that he's the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? That's right, how he right. identifies yeah, himself, yeah. right? I think it's fascinating that that same John, the disciple that Jesus loved, in Revelation 1, when he sees Jesus in that eternal glory, that it says he dropped dead. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The disciple that Jesus loved saw Jesus outside of his strictly human form and dropped dead. Right. He right. couldn't handle it. Yeah, yeah. And it said the spirit had to pick him up. Mm -hmm. Hold on, but let, let me just, just. All he saw before that was his condensation. I mean, yeah, his condescension. Con yeah, right. That's all he saw before that. So. To see him in glory, and it, that's just a vision. Like, that's just the Lord allowing him to see a little something, something. Listen to this. Just listen. Listen to this, right? Then I, so he, the Lord's talking to him, right? Write what you see and look and send it to the seven churches. This is what he's telling John. Then he says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. 
His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in the furnace. And his voice was like the, the roar of many waters. Let me just say this real quick. People use this scene to say Jesus was Darcy. That's not what this scene is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the bronze is not Jesus was from Africa, fam. That he was looking like me. So like, it says, in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Hmm. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I mm -hmm. have the keys of death and Hades. Right? So he sees Jesus, the disciple who Jesus loved, and he drops dead. Right. You think you are going to stand before God and be like, hey, what's up, Lord? It's good to see you, fam. It's a wrap. Right. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. You're going to see the Lord and be like, blam, I'm yeah. dropping. I mean, we have encounters like that now. 100%. Like, you know, being filled with the Spirit of God, we have encounters where it's almost as if though we're before the Lord yes. and we drop. You know what I'm saying? I can't imagine. I oh can't God. imagine. Like, I mean, even, you know, when Peter saw the, the fish, when Peter saw the abundance yeah. of fish come in and he fell before Jesus' man. feet, like, hey, from me, depart from me from a wicked man. Like, <laughs> that was just getting some extra fish, fam. Right, was like, right. He just, he just knew, like, that God is glory is so good. You just, you just realize how dirty you are. Right. Isaiah, man, look at how dirty I am. He said, look, right. he was undone. Undone. Undone, fam. Do you yeah. think you're not going to be undone when you stand before the Lord? We're going to be undone. If the disciple whom Jesus loved, who spent three years with him, who let him live to be the and who showed him a vision of all these things to come, if he saw him and was like, bloop, drop, man. That's why so, whenever people be like, yeah, I saw Jesus, or yeah, I had a dream, and I, or yeah, I died and went to heaven. Or, I'm like, wait, what, what did you see when you saw him? And they're, oh, he was so nice and so happy. And I'm like, fam, yes, he is generous, kind, yeah. loving, all those things. But your first exposure to him with your eyes? <laughs> nah, nah, fam. I mean, you're talking about the uncreated being. Right. Like, <laughs> come on, fam. In full That's glory, fam. Yeah, yeah. No, Remember no, no, no. at the Transfiguration, Peter ain't know what to do. Uh, Lord, it's, 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 tents. It's, it's good that we're here. Uh, <laughs> let me let me build a couple of tents. Right. He's like, nah, fam, we ain't staying up here too long, fam. We about yeah. to go right down there. It's like, I just think we don't, I, I think it's our responsibility to cultivate that, right? This is why we get these visions in Revelation, so that we can cultivate an endless fascination and sober ourselves with like, man, we're going to stand before him and give an account. Right. I mean, this passage, Revelation 20, 11 through 15, is, is, is ridiculous, isn't this? Yes. Then I saw a great white throne and him who seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. That line right there is crazy. Earth and sky fled, bro. And no place was found was for no them. No place. Like, you could, like, where, they couldn't hide <laughs> nowhere. They couldn't chill nowhere. Where did they, they go? Gone. <laughs> right? And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. Hmm. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Wow. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Hmm. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake, man, there's so much I want to say about this right now. I'm not going to. <laughs> This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Like, this is, okay, this is serious. Yeah. This is serious, man. There's this. Yes. This is serious. And so, uh, so circling back, I think when you think about I'm not growing, you need to process that statement. Circling back to last week's episode that we, that we canceled, we've already explained why. When you think about I'm not growing, I think we have to really evaluate what, why am I not growing? Like, what do I really think and believe? What am I doing? What am I really doing or not doing? Because think about this for a second. Let's just break down. Let's just do this real quick. Let's do a quick exercise. There are 168 hours in a week, all right? You will sit under preaching, typically, typically, 
you will sit under preaching one hour a week out of 168 hours, all right? You will fellowship with other believers. So on that Sunday, and then possibly at a small group meeting during the week. So let's just say you have four or five hours of fellowship with other believers every week. Okay, so let's add that up. So let's go five hours. So now you have six hours of your week are devoted to hearing the word and fellowshipping with other believers, right? You have 162 hours left in your week, all right? Let's say you get eight hours a day sleep. I don't know anyone who gets eight hours a day anymore, but let's say you get eight hours a day, right? Now you have 56 hours are devoted to sleeping. So that's now 62 hours total. You have 108 hours left in your week. All right. Now let's talk about your job. You work 40 hours a week, five days a week. All right. But let's just go to 50. Let's say you work 50 hours a week in your job. Right. That's 50 plus 62. That's 112 hours. So now you got sleeping, church fellowship and your job take up 112 hours of your week. You still have 56 hours left of a week. What are you doing with all that time? 56 hours after you take out church, sleeping, let's go 10 hours a week you eat. 10 hours a week you eat. So now you have 46 hours left that don't require, that are not church, that are not sleeping, that are not eating, and that are not working. Or fellowship. Or fellowship. 40 hours plus a week. Many of us, if we're honest, spend probably 17 to 20 of those hours on social media, binge watching shows on whatever platforms that we watch them on, right? And then you add maybe another, if we're godly, maybe seven hours a week to 10 spending time on the word on, on ourselves, right? Still got 12 hours left. We have a lot of time in the course of a week. And when you break it down and you realize, how much am I spending my time on fill in the blank? Most churches do not require more than six, uh, most. I know some churches, they be like, we meet Monday, we got a prayer meeting Tuesday, we got a board meeting Wednesday, we got a, you know. It, but most churches, particularly in this day and age, post-COVID, people ain't going to church. You only get, so just imagine if you decide you're not going to church that Sunday and you're not going to watch the live stream. Then that's an that's that's probably three hours of your week interacting with other believers gone. And if you don't go to your small group or whatever structure you have that week, then your six hours, and this is on average, obviously, don't hit me like, oh man, Kurt, that's not actually, because Pew Research, I'm just, you know what I'm doing. I'm just breaking it down. When you think about this in your life in terms of 168 hours weekly, how much of it is really spent cultivating endless fascination in the Lord? If you only get, so this, and this is why I try, this is why I don't like, and again, there are people who leave my church legitimately because for legitimate reasons, I am not in any way saying did you do when you everyone who left left because they're not at all. So for those of people who are watching and waiting, I'm not saying that. But here, let's but let's be honest. At most, you get an hour from me reminding you, teaching you, or any pastor of the word of God. That's one hour out of 168 hours in the week. There's no way I can feed you or do anything for you in one hour out of 168. No pastor can do that. No pastor can do that. No leader can do that. You get one hour where you're hearing the word and some people don't even feel like doing that. It's fascinating to me. We have to make sure that we're aware of and have a conviction or, and that we're paying attention. Hey, if I'm not growing, is it really me? Hmm. And maybe you should leave your church, but if you go to another church or you don't find a church for a while, you have to consider, I might've been wilding though. Hmm. It might've been me for real. 
Because honestly, I don't know any pastor whose preaching is that good that his sermon on Sunday is going to carry you through all week. And if you got one, praise God for him because I ain't that gifted. I don't know many who are. You forget what I, I forget what I taught by Wednesday. So again, we, we need to be careful when we think I'm not growing and when we think there are no consequences for not take, working on our salvation with fear and trembling. I genuinely, most Christians wouldn't say that in a sentence, but I genuinely think a lot of us, and I felt this way too, truth be told. I'm not, I'm not walking, the, listen, I'm not coming down the mountain with two stone tablets. I've, I've failed in this area too. But I think we genuinely think that we're good. We're riding on fumes and we're good. There are no consequences for it. There's no consequences. If I'm not, if I don't go to church, like what do I need to go back to church for? I'm not, it's not that I can watch it online. We talked about this last week. When you watch it online, you don't fellowship with nobody. You're distracted. You're folding clothes, eating cereal, all of that. You're yeah. doing a bunch of stuff and you just, and you got used to it. And then you're just distracted. The sermon is like background noise. When you're there live though, you got to pay attention. You got, you got to focus. You're listening. You're laughing. You're, you're in the atmosphere. It's just a different vibe. So again, I think that circling back and closing, there are consequences that are intentionally not immediate by God, not because there are none, but because he's gracious and giving us time to see what's going on. But if we're slowly not growing and we're growing in a lack of desire for the Lord, if you're not at least considering that the person that you look at in the mirror is part of the problem, then I think you're being deceived by a scheme of the devil. Because there's too much emphasis on keep yourself in the love of God. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Second Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourself, examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. Those aren't things any pastor, any leader, any brother can do for you. Those are things you have to do for yourself. I have to do it. Mm -hmm. I have to do that. I have to hold myself accountable. And well, the way I do that is I recognize I'm going to stand before God and give an account. It talks about pastors doing a lot, but we're not the only ones who are going to give an account. <laughs> oh, man, it's just wild, man. Being a pastor in this day and age, my friend, is no joke, bro. Yeah. It's no joke. And there are times, I, but my church blessed me on Sunday, though. My church, I want to end with this. My church super blessed Mike and I, my colleague. Uh, it was the last, it was the second to last day of Pastors Appreciation Month, and they surprised us. They had a big, my mom was there, his mom was there. Oh, that's They great. shared words of encouragement to us. We have a thing that we do at our church called Worthy of Honor. Uh, in Revelation 12, I mean, Romans 12, it says, outdo one another in showing honor. Mm -hmm. So when we planted a church eight years ago, we would do these meetings on a Sunday called Worthy of Honor, where we wouldn't preach. And we, Mike or I, and I sometimes, we different times, we would highlight different people in the church. We would honor them publicly and then leave the mic open for people to just randomly come up and encourage them. And those are always amazing Sundays because you get to hear the grace of God in people's lives. And it's not pre-planned. The only people that would know Who's getting honored are usually me and Mike or me, Mike, and our leadership team. So on Sunday, they essentially gave us a significant worthy of honor where my mom was there, his mom was there, my son participated in a skit, uh, and different members of the church. It was emotional. I was crying. We were affected. It was really cool because there are times when you do feel underappreciated as a pastor, especially when people, this is why when I started the last episode last week, I said, I'm about to humble myself because I don't, maybe other pastors do this. When people leave my church, I always think like, tag, man, I wonder if, and there are times I'm just, I, I don't dwell on it. Cause you got to keep, when people leave, I kind of, for lack of a better way, I emotionally, when people leave, I emotionally move on because I have too many other people that I need to care about. Like once you right. leave, you're gone. I may still like you. It might not be no hard feelings, but I'm not thinking about you. I'm not worried about, you know, what you're doing and what's happening. You know, if we end up catching up somehow, cool. And there's some people that have left that I keep up with. I mean, that happens. It just happens. Because it usually, 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 it's not 
we're not enemies. It's not bitter, usually, right? right? But, but for the most part, but once you leave my church, I don't have any, I, I got to give an account for the people that are here. So I don't extend, I'm not thinking about what you're doing. If I hear about you, I'll be like, oh man, that's too bad. I'll pray for him. I'm not thinking about it. So when you're when you're in this situation, you just you just kind of focus on the people that are there. And when you feel underappreciated, it's just like, Dad, what do you do, right? So our church, man, they just they super encouraged us. They had some gifts for us. Then there was a lunch afterwards where they made some brisket. <sighs> Oh my gosh, macaroni and cheese is great. It was just a, it was, it was a great, it was a great time. And it wasn't just because we got encouraged. There were particular things that happened that really just, just were good for my soul. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm kind of a tough guy, man's man, like X Street dude. But you know what though? I need encouragement too, man. Yeah. And sometimes when you don't get, you feel that, right? You feel that, like that lack of it. You know, you feel, and I get a lot of it on YouTube. It's funny. I get a lot of, people are like, man, bro, I just love you know. I do some with rules on. Everyone's like, bro, I love this dude, man. Where's he coming from? You get some people to be like, man, this dude's fat. I'm not listening to this dude. So I like those comments too, right? <laughs> um, and so, but I just it was it was really dope, man. On Sunday that our church did that, and there was a lot of people that registered for the lunch. So I'm not saying all. Sometimes I say things that make it sound like my church. Now my church is amazing, man. And even the people that left, I don't ultimately have problems with them. What I don't like is I just don't like you to blame it on me when you should probably consider if you're part of the problem. Hmm. You know, that's the that's the issue I have. It's like they don't because I think that's not gonna help you. I'm worried. I still I'm worried. if you say, Oh, this is the pastor, this is it's like that. What about what about you? Like what were you how were you pressing in? Like how was I hindering you from pressing in? Mm-hmm. That's the question no one ever tells you. How did I hinder you from pressing into the Lord? Because that's where the real confrontation would come in. Now you're talking about a whole nother episode. Because if you ask that question, that would bring out the real issue. And and nobody really wants to have the real issue on the forefront. That's why you you get emails that tell you they're leaving without them having a conversation with you before they leave. Yeah, because you have to have an explanation. Yeah, not only would there be an explanation required, but there also have to be a defense of that explanation. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, and I get it, man. I get it. I get. It. I'm not saying that there there are good reasons to leave churches. Sometimes you're just going through some stuff, and you, I get it, man. I get it. What I don't want to say though is that like every time somebody leaves and says it's this, that it's always that. Right. I think we would do better to say, you know what? I may. I'm, I'm probably. I'm, I'm going to leave the church, but I need to do some work here. Like at the expense of, you know, people maybe getting offended. Whatever. The reality is, I'm not growing. Has become the. Like, you know how dudes or chicks used to say to their mate, like, it's not you, it's, it's me. me. Right, you right, right. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, I, like that's what that's what it's become. I, the I'm not growing has kind of become the, what do I say? How do I leave here? I don't want to be here anymore. Oh, I'm not growing. That's right. appeasable. That People right. can, that's respectable. I'm not right. growing. You know what I'm saying? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to me, I'm not growing is the new, I feared for my safety, so I shot him. That's good. That's, that's another one. Me. Yeah, it's good. That's, that's why I felt like I felt like there, that time when there was a lot of like police shootings. It was like I did, if they say I fear for my safety, boom, everyone's like, okay, look, there's a big black dude anyway. It's like, man, that's not an excuse, man. You you have a, you bring you bring a deadly weapon into every interaction with people. And don't get me wrong, there are times where police should fear for their safety. Mm-hmm. Dudes be wilding, but not every time that that happens. They so it's the same thing to me. It's like I'm not growing. It's like okay, okay, go to. The, that's why I say, look, don't go here if you can't grow here. I'm not offended right. at that. But I get offended when you try to say, oh, or not, I don't get offended, but I just think I don't agree with you. And then right. if you don't agree with people's evaluation of it, then they can be tempted and act like you're being defensive. And it's like, look, fam, I don't, I don't have to agree that this is, I, I know you too, you know what I'm saying? I know you too. So, I, and, I've, and, I've, and sometimes I speak not about my church. I speak as if it's my church, but sometimes I'm speaking for other pastors mm-hmm. that, that I here struggle with this stuff i hear i've met a lot of pastors over the last two years that have really struggled with this and and um you know what this brother look let me let me let me, let me show you how this works this look this is what you put jay for your show. i was guilty of that glad we cleared the air on that kurt i should have hit you first solid brother right here right mm-hmm. solid brother he was gone i hit him he was like, yeah, he told me what was up. Said, listen, bro, do what you got to do for you and your wife. 
Me and that brother, we still talk. As a matter of fact, and this is what I mean, like that stuff can still happen. It's not always, he he acknowledged, look, I was wrong. I should have hit you. Brother, no problem, man. Love is there. You know what? The video that I just put out today, there was a different ending and I hit him and asked him, could he switch out the ending and make it the current? And he did that for me and sent me back the file like two days ago. I dropped the video, best rapper alive today. I still talk to this brother. He'll text me. We'll talk about music. We joke around. They can still be loved there. Because you know what? He didn't blame me and make it seem like it was on me. He understood, hey, this is a me and my wife thing. We're going to pull out. And I said, brother, I support you. Do what you do. Right, we right. still talk. But then there are people who I've invested in much more than that who act like it was on. So again, it's just it's a, it's a weird dynamic. Because sometimes there's some element of truth. But it's like, man, just don't. We have to start with self-assessment. That's what mm -hmm. I'm getting at. There are consequences for not growing, and it's not always... I'm talking about the man you know, in the mirror. 100%. The immortal words of Mike Jack. You got to talk about that. And I think a lot of people don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. and, then, and some people will get offended at this today. Listen, I don't, I'm don't. i not reading any of the, any emails. I'm good, fam. I get it. I get it. You're not. We're, we're not in fellowship. I get it. Think what you want. Say whatever. If it's slander, I'm going to expose it to the people that I care about you know i'm going to do that because i'm not going to let that happen but i'm not going to be entertained i'm not doing no back and forth with nobody this is, it is what it is i get it i understand but i'm not going to let people act like oh this is that like I, we see what's going on we're hip we hip we know what's going on we see it and there are people that who are members of our church who see it too for for my church but to the pastors man who who are watching it, who struggle with this stuff listen man continue to persevere right press in just continue to press into the lord Sometimes you're going to get things like what happened at my church on Sunday, but sometimes you just not. And you just keep fighting. And, and this is, I want to encourage every pastor who is, finds himself in that place. I want to encourage you with this. This is actually now for me. This is my pastoral worldview right now. This is my complete pastoral worldview to, ever, to all this stuff, the emails I'll get. This is my pastoral worldview, 1 Corinthians 4. Let me read this to all of you pastors who, who are going through some things. And then I would say, if you decided you can't do it, come to my church. My church is vicious, baby. But look, this is what Paul said. He said, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Hmm. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Now, let me just say this real quick. You have to understand, Paul pastored the Corinthian church for almost two years, longer than any other of the letters he wrote. In fact, some of the letters that Paul wrote, like Colossians, and he didn't even, get to, he didn't even go to those churches. But Corinthians, he spent almost two years with which is right. why he wrote four letters to them. Two of them we have. We have his second and fourth letter. We call them first and second Corinthians. Here's Paul writing to people that he spent almost two years with. And he said this. He said, but it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. I love that. He's saying, look, I'm not aware of any sinful way that I've reacted to you, but that doesn't mean I'm acquitted. Right. Doesn't mean I'm right. This is why I love, this is why this is my mantra. If I'm not aware of it, it doesn't mean I'm right, but I'm not going to pretend like because you struggle with something that I did something wrong objectively. Right. And he says, I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. That's my pastoral mantra. That's how I'm, that's, that's it for me. I'm, I'm not being judged. I don't, I'm not, send me an email, do what you want. I'm not, I'm not, I don't care about your judgment. And it's not because I'm being proud. It's just, I'm not going to, I'm going to wait for the Lord to be like, this was where I feel like if, now if I'm aware of something, I'm going to act on it. Right. You know, when I get stuff, I send it to people. I trust track, read this. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you think. 
uh, leadership team, tell me what you think. I'll get email, but hey, tell me if, if we should all be like that. But for you, mm -hmm. pastor, sometimes you got people judging you and they're just, and you feel like, man, humility says you got to receive it and act like you and agree with it. If you're not, you're just defensive. Nah, fam. Sometimes it's like, all right, the, you're not, you, if you're not aware of it, that doesn't mean you're acquitted. That doesn't mean I'm acquitted because I may disagree with what someone says, an observation. It does not mean I'm acquitted. But I'm not going to sit around and entertain all these perspectives. Because mm, right. sometimes they come from people who aren't that aren't that focused on the Lord themselves. And it's like that's I'm right. not. That's right. I'm not going. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not acquitted. But I'm going to wait for the Lord. I'm not going to judge myself or be judged by you. I'm going to wait for the Lord. Praise that, God. That's in the Bible. That's a huge, a huge, I think, way to process what it means to be, especially in this day and age. Yeah, I'd imagine it's a burden day. lifted. It's a burden lifted. It's a burden lifted. Yeah. It's a burden lifted. So before we go, I do want to share uh, something yes, encouraging. Yeah, tell the story, brother. Something encouraging. No, not that story. Oh, uh, okay. This, okay. Uh, that story went well, but I already touched on it, I think, enough um, that I don't need to bring it up. But what I did want to share is, um, so this past weekend I went and I visited Christ Alone Fellowship. We talked about Christ Alone Fellowship before, uh, the the hosts of The Basement, the show they used to be on. Yeah, 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 right. Losing with. them. Los and Wayne, Los and yeah, 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 Los yep. Juan Carlos is the pastor there. Wayne also pastors. Good dudes, solid dudes. It's good yeah, dudes. solid dudes. Yep. So Love those we dudes. we had mentioned them before on the show numerous times, obviously. Mm -hmm. But one time that we had mentioned them, I guess there was some followers of ours that listened to them, and the uh, the man is actually he's a pastor, and his son uh, recently st uh, started going to Lancaster Bible College, mm. and. Um, when I went on Sunday, I met his son there. His son comes over. He starts talking to me and Carlos. And he's like, yo, man, I just want to tell you. Oh, so you, you know, went to Los's church? I went. To, I visited Los's okay. church on that's Sunday. Right. Yeah, we went We went a little bit earlier because we were supposed to head down your way. So we had already planned on going to his church. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. so we went to his church and got all that. You know, So we had, we had a great time over there. But anyway, um, we, I met this young man. He comes over. He says, he goes, Los says, yo, this is Strack. And he goes, oh, man, you're Strack. And so he starts telling me this whole story about how his family – found out about Christ Alone Fellowship through our podcast because his dad is an avid listener of our podcast. Who's mm. He's a pastor out in Philadelphia, Philadelphia area somewhere. Philadelphia. Yeah, the Philadelphia. So he, that, the, they were looking for a solid church for their son to go to while he was in the Lancaster area going to college. And through our podcast, they found Christ Alone Fellowship or That's Christ cool. Alone Church. Yeah, so... So I thought that was pretty dope. He wanted to take a picture with me and everything to show his dad as evidence. But just so that you know, even pastors are listening and being encouraged, man, by what we're doing here. So as you gave admonition to the pastors um, to consider things that you were saying, there's one that's listening for sure. And right. salute to you, brother, and to your son, Josh. Amen, I believe his name was Josh, and to your wife and your family. Yeah. Um, God bless y'all. No, I do. And I mean, I will say, I, you know, I'm grateful. I do get... I do get encouragement a lot for the show. Yeah. You yeah. know, I do get encouragement. And 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 sometimes I'll bounce, hey man, you're an elder. Like, do you think this was wrong that we said this? I'll do that from time to time. Right. With people that I know that we do have people who have ha, are in leadership and who feel like they want to honor the Lord. And that's what that isn't that that's a challenging part because you'll have people be like, Brother, I don't think you did anything wrong. And I don't right. think they're starstruck or something. I'm genuinely asking, like, I'm not offended. I've taken stuff down after off of one person saying Hey, can you, I was uncomfortable that you did that. Okay, cool. Right. But that doesn't mean I'm going to always do it. And in this situation, I, I didn't have time to really investigate if I should, because I had heard that another she email was going, and I was like, you know what, let me just take it down before I even have time to investigate if I really feel like we should do this and do what the original email was asking to do. So, but that happens. It's, it's life. I get it. I've been a pastor for 14 years and I've seen a lot and I'm sure I got a lot more coming as long as I'm in this role. So, mm -hmm. Having said that, man, we are grateful for y'all, man. Like and subscribe to the channel. Stop playing, man. Stop playing. I'm grateful we have been growing. This is like a longer episode for this is old school with us, right? This is we old school. We have a two-hour yeah. episode in a minute. I was feeling it. My knees yeah. was feeling it. Like, yo, stand up, man. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I know I got to use the bathroom. I'm all trying to hold it. Like, man, I want to be like, hold on and get up, you know. The you get older, boy. Them, them, things, them things change, right? Yeah. But we're for grateful sure. for you, man. Thank you so much. And that, listen, we already talked about this, but we just want to remind you again. You guys support us well with just being a part of it and in the comments. We don't always get to read them and go through them because we're talking and we don't get thrown off. But we're grateful for you. Grateful for those of you who listen. Yes. Uh, don't forget to, man, please go get this. 
Serial killer smiling pictures. Yes, go, go to KurtKennedy.com. Pick this joint up. It's really on Bandcamp, but it's easier to just send you to KurtKennedy.com, right? So go to KurtKennedy.com. Download, get, buy that joint, get it, listen to it, have fun with it. Again, it's not your traditional Kurt Kennedy project. It's not, wasn't meant to be. So if you don't like it, I'm not offended. It's just, it's not, the one coming in January will be a little bit closer to what you're, I'm used to doing. But it was a good time. It's a good project. Don't forget, Strike's got some music dropping out. Check that out. Go to Abner's Brush. You know, I, I showed y'all the, the, the click him, but he got the brush though. He vicious with the brush, right? Mm -hmm. Go there, check that out. Don't forget to check us out on Twitter. I'm Kirk Kennedy at his hype man. Yes. And for those of you that missed the beginning, yes, baby. Yeah, keep it back there. Keep it back there because you can see it better. Yep. Yeah, yeah right there. Oh, oh, like oh, this. Oh, there yeah, go. like that. Yeah. Hey, Look at hey. this, man. This that is joint is hard. Yeah. My first joint. My first joint, and it went gold. Yeah, yeah this stuff. is my first uh, picture that I've gotten blown up this size. I've actually never really got any of my photos professionally done. I've gotten some like different things, but not like that. So I'm really, so there's three photos that I want to get. Now that I like that one, I'm going to order two more, uh, one next week and one at the end of the month and just place them in my office. One here, one here, and one right there. Nice. And just to, just to just kind of be like, yeah, man, it's been cool. So I'm really stepping my game up and all of that. Listen. Uh, if you're interested, go to Patreon. The link will be in the description. Subscribe as a Patreon subscriber. We've done a terrible job. We actually gave our Patreon supporters the mixtape free. Please. I don't know if they're getting emails, so if you buy it, I appreciate it too. But if you're a Patreon subscriber, you got the mixtape free today. I know this is Chris got that joint. He was already like, thank you, fam. Uh, but we're starting in January, Strack and I want to step our game up and start doing some things that we did before some other things for the Patreon subscribers. So please just join us. You can subscribe five bucks a month. It really helps us build what we're doing. Like and subscribe to the channel. Leave comments on the video. Grateful yes. for you. Appreciate you. If you're offended at me, I just, I don't want to read you. I'm not going to read your emails. So I'm just telling you in advance. Just, just call me whatever you want. I'm not going to read them. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I get it. I, you know, I, I get it. So I'm just not even going to deal with it. If it comes in, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not going to deal with it because I just think it's different. We're in a different place right now. And, you know, love is love, but I'm just going to keep it moving. So, you know what I'm saying? I just don't, I don't got time for that stuff, man. You know, I don't got time. I got too much going on right now. All right. Having said that, I'm Kirk Kennedy. He's Strack the Wolverine. Yeah. We are out Come of here, on already. Grace and peace.